Okay, uh, I think we can start. Uh, so welcome to everybody and uh, to these the two days uh, seminar webinar entitled EFUELS, uh, Prospects in Production and Use, uh, organized uh, by the Department of Energy Politecnico di Milano. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Alessandra Beretta. I'm a professor in this department uh, and uh, I work uh, in the catalysis uh, group. Uh, um, today, the focus uh, of uh, this uh, event uh, is uh, on e-fuels. For those uh, not familiar, we mean with uh, e-fuels, uh, synthetic fuels, uh, where the carbon and hydrogen needed uh, are provided by carbon neutral feedstock uh, or even captured CO2 and renewable uh, green hydrogen or hydrogen produced by renewable energy. So today we would like to discuss uh, and have an overview of uh, the status of development uh, of the production technologies uh, of uh, e fuels, uh, but also to hear on their perspective uh, of their use and penetration in the market. Uh, so we have uh, this uh, two session event, uh, and we will listen to the contribution of uh, in house uh, speakers uh, and uh, guests uh, from outside. The in house uh, speakers uh, will be Professor Matteo Romano. Professor Carlo Visconti and Professor Tommaso Lucchini. And from outside, uh, we will have uh, the viewpoint, uh, the, the more industrial uh, uh, viewpoint uh, from Dr. Stefano Rossini, ENI, Dr. Galina Skorikova from TNO, a research center in uh, Northern Holland, and from Dr. Gil Sardi from uh, CNH uh, Industrial. Uh, before starting uh, to, uh, with uh, uh, the topic of today, I would like to give uh, a very brief introduction uh, on the general framework uh, within which uh, events like these uh, are organized. Uh, and uh, I certainly need to apologize uh, with those uh, who attended also yesterday's seminar on hydrogen, because we had uh, a twin seminar on hydrogen. Uh, but for the sake, at least, uh, of our guests, uh, I really would like to introduce uh, what energy for motion is. Uh, energy for motion is a big uh, departmental uh, project uh, that's involving and gathering uh, several, the last uh, majority of the research groups uh, that is, uh, has as goal uh, the development uh, of uh, knowledge uh, research uh, uh, related to the energy technologies uh, for the new generation vehicles. Uh, in this department, uh, in fact, uh, we are studying uh, new solutions, uh, new processes uh, for the production uh, of innovative uh, fuels. Uh, we are studying uh, the continuous improvement uh, of, uh, of the energy efficiency or the after-treatment uh, technologies uh, for uh, 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 internal combustion engine vehicles. But we are also deeply involved uh, in the development of technology for the electrification of the vehicles uh, by studying fuel cells uh, and batteries. But we are also involved uh, in uh, studying uh, the impact uh, on uh, economical, uh, environmental, but also societal uh, uh, level uh, the impact uh, of the choices uh, with regard uh, to mobility. Uh, we have uh, activated this uh, very important uh, project. Uh, we started uh, this uh, project uh, thanks uh, to a significant uh, grant uh, from the Ministry of University and uh, the financial support uh, has been devoted uh, most of it uh, to the recruiting of uh, new young researchers uh, in the department. 
but a lot uh, of this uh, has been also devoted uh, to improve uh, our laboratorial infrastructures uh, in this department. Uh, the experimental activities uh, are a very, very important uh, backbone uh, of our research. And then a lot is also devoted uh, to teaching and we have uh, really decided uh, to empower at the best, uh, the PhD program. So activating uh, new grants uh, and trying to do our best uh, to make more attractive uh, the choice uh, of uh, the PhD program. And then, of course, we are also trying to organize uh, occasions uh, like this, uh, where here in the Department of Energy, researchers uh, from the department, uh, researchers uh, from other uh, outstanding uh, research uh, centers uh, and uh, industry gather and uh, allow us uh, to give us uh, the forefront uh, of, uh, of the technological knowledge. Uh, we have also uh, a very, very uh, interesting board uh, of, the, of advisors uh, from industry and uh, academia and uh, six uh, advisors uh, Professor Gasteiger, Professor Passerini, Professor Zutel, but also a very, very uh, outstanding expert from industry, Dr. Venturini from NLX, Dr. Polesel from ENI, Dr. Jesereitz from Cummins, and they are monitoring the evolution of our research and allow us to keep updated with the different aspects and viewpoints of, of, of industry and academia concerning the broad team of the topic of mobility. So coming to today's event, I'm really glad to start with the in-house contribution from uh, Professor uh, uh, Matteo Romano. Matteo is, uh, comes from, uh, belongs uh, to the GECUS group, uh, the uh, group of energy conversion system, and his contribution is entitled uh, Overview on E-Fuels uh, from a System Perspective. But uh, I forgot uh, to give a very important information, so before leaving the floor for Matteo, uh, let me recall, especially to all the people, uh, who are attending uh, uh, by remote uh, this uh, event, uh, please uh, deliver your question to the speakers uh, by using the form uh, that you have received when enrolling uh, to the event. Unfortunately, uh, we really don't think that we will, have, uh, we will be able to challenge uh, our speakers with questions uh, in between uh, the talks, uh, but we will try to gather them and then inquire and stimulate the discussion at the very end where we will have a panel discussion. But please start already during the speeches to write your questions that, of course, we will try to review and then maybe gather and then convey to our speaker. So. With this, I think I did my homework, and uh, we can start with the first contribution from Matteo. Matteo. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, yeah, the, the first presentation of the session on, uh, if you will, from a system perspective. Let me start in presentation mode. One second. Oh. Okay. So, um, if fuels are synthetic fuels produced from uh, hydrogen from electrolysis, as also Alessandro introduced before. Um, here we focus on carbon-based synthetic fuels produced from CO2 and 
hydrogen from electrolysis. There is another class of important e-fuels. Actually, it's not a class, it's a single e-fuel that is ammonia that is uh, gaining a lot of interest uh, recently. But, uh, yeah, I can. But uh, we, this presentation was, will not deal with, uh, with this. So we only focus on carbon-based synthetic fuels. So for an e-fuel based on carbon, you need basically two sources, a source of uh, energy, that is electric energy that uh, feeds an electrolysis system to produce green hydrogen, and a source of carbon, that is CO2, that can be collected from uh, air, from biogenic carbon, or from an industrial point source. You need that CO2 capture system to make the CO2 concentrated and delivered to the synthesis plant, where hydrogen and CO2 are combined to produce a class of, uh, of fuels based on carbon, like uh, methanol, fissure trap fuel, methane, etc. All these systems can include also a series of uh, storage of mass and energy, like batteries and hydrogen and CO2, to deal with the intermittency of the renewable energy sources. The advantages of e-fuels are that they are high energy density fuels that can store electric energy in the end. And so it's a way for of indirect electrification of the economy or of the transport system. Um, it, they also allow the use of existing infrastructure for transport distribution and use. There are some projections from uh, IEA to understand how important these fuels can be, just focusing on the two uh, charts in, in red, we can see the increase of uh, potential use of CO2 in time. Um, most uh, of the source of carbon in the long term will come from biogenic CO2 and from air through DAC, so direct air capture. We also see that uh, the amount of CO used to produce e-fuels will start uh, ramping up in, in some decades, not, not in the short term. And on the right hand side, you see the, how hydrogen will be used uh, in, in the future, correct, in, based on the projections of IEA. And we also see that after 2050, there is uh, an increased share of the use of hydrogen for uh, sim fuel production and also ammonia that was mentioned before. So the quick, key questions here is, what is the, ro the role that e-fuels can have in the energy transition process? And we need to focus on three main aspects that are energy efficiency, environmental impact, that means overall carbon balance here, and economics. About energy efficiency, well, of course, uh, the e-fuels production requires a series of conversion processes, and each conversion process inevitably in involves some energy loss. So from electric energy, assume 100, you have a loss of around 30% in the electrolysis system, assuming that you are using a low temperature process. Then there is some losses in the fuel synthesis process. This is mainly based on thermodynamic issues. It is due to thermodynamic issues as uh, the reactions that are needed to produce the e-fuels are exothermic on the whole, so you lose some energy there. Uh, and then you have the use of uh, the fuel in a thermodynamic cycle if it is used for energy purposes. So in the end, you have a, a power to power efficiency of around 20-30% uh, when you have uh, an e-fuel in between um, com to be compared to around 70-90% of the direct use of electricity. So um, direct use of electricity is preferable over e-fuels uh, from an energy efficiency perspective. A second aspect to, to be considered that uh, I think is interesting is to answer this question. Does it make sense to produce e-fuels from CO2 originated from combustion of another fuel? This is an important question because most of the CO2 generated from industrial processes today derives from the combustion of other fuels. So the question is, does it make sense to make e-fuels from that CO2? And we can answer this question by a simple example. As let's assume to have one kilomole of, of CO, to burn it with a 90% efficiency, producing a 255 megajoule of heat and generating one kilomole of CO2. To produce an e-fuel such as uh, methanol, the simplest uh, one we can consider, we need three kilomoles of hydrogen uh, per each kilomole of CO2. To produce these three kilomoles of hydrogen, assuming 70% uh, efficiency of the electrolysis system, we need a uh, electric energy of 1029 megajoule electric. 
What is the alternative here? The alternative here would be to produce uh, methanol directly from the mole of CO that we had uh, originally. So in this case, we need only two kilomoles of hydrogen to produce one kilomole of methanol from the kilomole of CO. That means that we need 685 megajoule electric to produce that hydrogen. But we also need the heat. But uh, in many cases, heat can be produced by direct electricity, uh, by direct electric resistances. This is the simplest use if we don't want to assume more efficient heat pump system. So assuming a one-to-one -one, uh, electric energy to heat conversion, we find that we need additional 255 megajoule electric. So in total here, we need 940 megajoules. So on the overall, on the whole balance, uh, by avoiding the combustion of the fuel, but still producing methanol and still producing the same amount of heat that we need in the first system, we save 9% of the electricity and we save 33% of the uh, electrolysis size. The same exercise can be done with a fuel containing hydrogen, which is even, uh, which brings even additional advantages in avoiding the combustion of the hydrogen. We don't want, in other words, to combust hydrogen, produce water, and produce hydrogen again from electrolysis of that water. In other words, this is what would happen. So in the end, the, the, the answer here is that um, CO2, a system that considers CO2 from a combustion of a fuel to produce another e-fuel probably could be revised, should be handled with care, let's say. Another important aspect, uh, I will not uh, uh, spend too much time on this uh, slide because it's uh, more complicated than the simple message that, uh, that should come out. This is one of the recent studies on this issue that states that if you want to produce e-fuels, you need low carbon electricity. If you have uh, electricity with some carbon footprint, even relatively low carbon footprint, the overall carbon balance of your system will be, uh, will be that you will emit more CO2 than the one you are avoiding. Okay, another point to be discussed is uh, related to the environmental impact is the origin of carbon. Today we live in an economic model that is mostly like the one shown in the figure. We have an industrial sector burning fossil fuels, generating CO2 from fossil carbon, and well, both in industry and in the transport sector. We can think about an open carbon economic model where you have CO2 utilization, so CO2 capture and utilization of the CO2 generated by an industrial source and we would end up in an open carbon economic model with the CCU that is the one shown on the right. Of course, this system allows reducing the overall CO2 emissions uh, by around 50% compared to the current economic model. That is, of course, acceptable in the transition phase, but this is not sufficient in a long-term net zero scenario, which is uh, uh, one of the targets we have. So for a net zero scenario, uh, we need to compensate these emissions from uh, either a negative emission system, so uh, capturing CO2 from air either directly or from biomass, so biogenic CO2, and uh, having some geologic storage there to compensate the fossil CO2 emitted, or uh, a system where the CO2 used to produce the e-fuel derives directly from the atmosphere again, either from air capture or from biogenic origin. So how to produce, to provide the heat for the industry in this case? Well, again, you need to electrify the industry. So both economic models can work. In both cases, the key message here is that net zero e-fuel systems must include some form of atmospheric uh, CO2 capture, either director capture or biogenic CO2 capture. Another message, uh, the last one of it, this first part, is on the best use of renewable energy in the transition phase. So we are in a period where we have a lack of, uh, not an abundance, an excess of renewable electricity. For many years, we still have a lack of renewable electricity. So the question is, where is the best way, the best place to use that uh, renewable kilowatt hours? Where do we have the most, the main advantages? So again, without entering into the details of this figure that is not uh, very simple, but just uh, a good reference, 
if anyone wants to, uh, uh, yeah, to assess it. Uh, it's pretty simple to find out that uh, to save uh, CO2 emitted to the atmosphere, it is better to use uh, the electricity primarily for heat generation through heat pump, uh, through uh, battery electric vehicles, or from storage in power to power systems. And power to fuel come next. So the key takeaways from this first part is that uh, direct use of electricity is preferable where possible, that if fuel schemes based on reversing the combustion should be avoided or should be revised unless it's very necessary for the specific case. From the environmental point of view, electricity used for e-fuels production must be low carbon. From net zero for a net zero target, the use of e-fuels requires either direct air capture or the use of carbon from biogenic origin, and that in the short term, higher environmental benefits are obtained from the use uh, of the scarce renewable electricity available. We come now to some economic considerations. Uh, in these charts, uh, we have a, well, an example of an economic analysis, pretty clear here. This is why I selected this, this analysis, uh, these charts showing the cost of e-fuel productions according to different scenarios. On the left-hand side, an optimistic one, assuming uh, uh, the cost of electricity, everything included, so also the management of the intermittency uh, of 30 euros per megawatt hour, and the cost of CO2 of 40 euros per ton. That means a con CO2 from a concentrated stream. On the right-hand side, a more pessimistic scenario where you have electricity at 50 euros per megawatt hour, and the cost of CO2 of 200 uh, euros per ton, that is typical of a direct air capture system. Uh, these costs have to be compared with, uh, can be compared with the cost uh, of a conventional fossil fuel like diesel at the pump in the EU uh, and the industrial cost. And of course, this is something that we can expect. Uh, the production of synthetic fuel ends up in a higher cost compared to conventional fossil fuels. But of course, decarbonization has a price. Um, but the, the key fee point from these figures is that if fuel production cost is dominated by the cost of hydrogen, that means renewable electricity and capital cost of the electrolysis system. And second point, if CO2 derives from direct air capture, such as in the right hand side, so expected cost of the order of 200, 400 euros per ton, CO2 costs become comparable to the cost of hydrogen. Um, so, based on, uh, on these considerations, uh, and also considering that the transport of liquid fuels over long distances is relatively low cost, and uh, there is uh, the infrastructure to do so, um, there are opportunities for e-fuels in uh, transporting renewable solar and wind power from low hydrogen, and, uh, hydrogen cost regions to industrialized, densely populated regions where, as we said before, better uses of renewable electricity exist. This means uh, uh, collecting uh, sun from uh, the uh, high insulation uh, regions of the world, but could also, for example, I was focusing this morning on the uh, peculiar case of Iceland that is very red in this chart and has very cheap uh, electricity and uh, potentially very low um, hydrogen production, low cost hydrogen production. Okay, to conclude my presentation, I'm going to show a case study coming from a recent uh, project uh, fledged um, on a flexible power and biomass to methanol plant. Uh, we assessed in this project, uh, uh, and, and uh, Galina will talk about it later, also the production of dimethylator, or actually the main focus was dimethylator there, but to make things simple here, we remain on, on methanol here. So the idea of this project was to assess a system uh, combining biomass gasification, single gas cleaning, production of, uh, of uh, uh, biofuels here, that is, in this case, biomethanol. Okay, in a normal conventional biofuel production plant like this one, you have an excess of carbon that has to be separated, and this is separated as CO2, as biogenic CO2 that is then vented to the atmosphere. The idea here is to combine the biofuel production plant with uh, an electrolysis unit to provide uh, hydrogen to increase the productivity of the, of the plant. 
So in this case, you see how the system would work with the electrolysis off when the electricity prices are high. This is the baseline operation. A second option, when uh, the electricity price reduces, the electrolysis unit is switched on. So you have uh, the production, the delivery of intermittent hydrogen that combined with the excess carbon from the biomass can produce an enhanced amount of, uh, of, of fuels, of power, of bio e-fuels, let's, let's call it in this way. So this is an enhanced operation that allows producing 60% more of the original biogenic methanol with a power to fuel efficiency of 57%. This, 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 this is collected in a recent paper that is going to be published very soon. It's uh, in press. So one question is also, um, how much time do we expect the plant to operate in enhanced mode, so with electrolysis on, or in baseline mode with electrolysis off? And to do this, we need to compare the, uh, to, to break even the cost of electricity with the selling price of, of the fuel, of methanol in this case. So if we consider, look at the green line, the cumulative uh, electricity price, we consider here the Denmark electricity price 2019, which is the European region with the highest uh, penetration of intermittent renewables. Um, so the green line is the cumulative uh, electricity price, and we see where it cross with uh, the yellow line, that is the short-term willingness to pay, that is again the break-even uh, point for a, a methanol selling price of uh, 450 euros per ton, we see that uh, we can buy electricity when the cost of electricity is below 49.1 euros per megawatt hour. So we have a system with an electrolysis capacity factor of around 81%. Uh, at this condition, we can, uh, by using other two curves, we can find that this means that for 81% of the time, we will have the electrolysis on, buying electricity at an average price of 34.7 euros per megawatt hour, and uh, the other 20% of the time, the electricity price is too high to, to use the electrolysis unit, and the average price in these cases is 55.7 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, so the message here is that the number of uh, op operating hours of the electrolysis systems depends on the willingness to pay, so the break-even price uh, of electricity versus the selling price of the product. Um, we also assessed uh, in this paper the uh, a modified uh, Denmark curve that could represent uh, a, an electricity price curve of the future where you have uh, on average, lower prices of electricity, but you also have higher peak prices when you have a, a lack of, of renewables, of intermittent renewables. Um, so we found that if you look at uh, the solid lines that refer to the current uh, price of electricity, um, the, the red line shows the internal rate of return as a function of the methanol selling price, showing that you need a, a methanol selling price higher than 520, more or less, uh, euros per ton. And at that price, you see the black solid line on the top. It means that, the, to be convenient, the electrolysis capacity factor will be higher than uh, 80%. With the uh, modified prices of electricity, so a possible future scenario, of course, the system will become more convenient uh, at lower methanol selling price, but the capacity factor required for the electrology system, the black uh, dashed line on the top, remains uh, still at pretty high capacity factors. This means that uh, we should think of a change of paradigm with respect to what we normally hear, that uh, we will use a surplus uh, renewable electricity to produce uh, e-fuels. Actually, we should uh, consider that e-fuels should operate most of the, e-fuel production plants should operate most of the time, switching off or not operating during the uh, elect high electricity prices, so when we have a scarcity of renewable electricity. And so the last uh, takeaways from economic considerations on the bottom are that uh, the economic competitivity of e-fuels mostly depends on the green hydrogen price, that we uh, should not rely on surplus electricity, but uh, should uh, not avoid operating, we should avoid using the scarce electricity when uh, uh, when there is scarcity of renewable electricity, 
and the opportunities largely lie in valorization of stranded renewable energy sources and increasing the carbon efficiencies of biomass to x systems. Thank you for your attention. Okay, I see that our next speaker is ready, Dr. Stefano Rossini. Stefano, good to see you again. And uh, Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Alessandra, I'm going to share my screen. Go ahead. Please. In the meanwhile, See. I have the pleasure to introduce okay. your talk entitled okay. E-Fuels in an Oil and Gas Company, Energy Transition Perspective. We are really eager to have news from ENI vision of E-Fuels. Stefano, the floor okay. is yours. Okay, hope you can see my screen and hope that is going to work in the proper way. In the meantime, I would like to thank Alessandra for this kind introduction and giving you a very warm welcome, uh, good afternoon, to, and, and let me express my pleasure to, be, to having, given, having been given the opportunity to give this talk to share to share with you some ideas on the if you will in the oil and gas energy transition perspective so i'm i'm grateful to uh, uh, matteo because he has already introduced a very significant concept uh, and i will try to enlarge a little bit um, the perspective uh, uh, starting from of course on recalling some of this uh, statement and uh, uh, evidences uh, he gave us in his previous talk. So you expect that uh, a smart speaker has a good agenda now to tell, to inform the, the, the audience what is going to do, to, or what is going to tell you. That's not my case. Uh, this is, I, I, I put this, uh, this image telling that I'm going to look at uh, fossil fuels, hydrogen, biofuels, and of course, uh, CO2 circular economy uh, in a, in a, and a, uh, and I was not able to find the specific line because I believe they are very, very much integrated. And I will try to uh, express, to show this, uh, this uh, concept. Uh, uh, let's move uh, uh, toward the fuels in this sense. And I, I like to define oil, oil and gas industry as the carbon champion because, you know, fossil fuels or carbon is our asset, our heritage, and no anyone as soon as he is uh, thinking to this uh, fossil fuel thinks to oil and gas industry. In this sense, in terms of climate changes, because at the end of the story, this is the point that we are tackling, uh, we have to consider the two main GHG gases. So methane as a primary source or a vector, whatever you want to, to call it in this sense, and CO2 as a they are the two main climate alterating agencies. Agents. So CO2, if methane is a primary source, CO2 is the a product, so it has to be managed in the proper way. So this brings us to CCS and then to circular economy if we want to convert this CO2 in some other things, some other products, as EF fuels can be. So the oil and gas, having assumed this perspective, is going to define its roadmap to contribute the to the climate plan, uh, climate planet improvement. And uh, in the meantime, in some way, switching from a carbon-based, fossil fuel-based company, oil and gas company, to an energy company. So going in. The, uh, so uh, what is known as energy transition, not only at world level, but also at the level of, uh, of uh, a company. And in this sense, we should frame also the e-fuels. But of course, 
to understand the, 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 the preferred route, the right route, we need to understand and to realize which will be the future energy system and the preferred type of mobility. In this sense, we need some outlook and just to avoid to be this how to be biased by some internal consideration, we refer to the International Energy Agency, IEA evaluation, and you can see in the upper part, in this part, you see that uh, the mix of uh, primary sources, the energy basket will be much different from what is today. So fossil fuel are, are still here, uh, covering 70% roughly, and they are going to decline. They are expecting to decline at the advantage of other kind of uh, sources, energy uh, sources. So, of course, here embedded, there is also the energy efficiency that is a powerful tool, uh, power leverage to reduce the impact on the climate here is expected to be in the in the here the, the, where it's most efficient uh, this uh, uh, energy efficient then of course due to the marginal increment of energy efficient and increase of, of uh, uh, population this will bring to the uh, flat of the demand if you go if you look at uh, the distribution of the the fuels uh, low emission you see there are a mixed with still some contribution of the fossil fuels based uh, um, materials in terms of uh, other directly in the low emission or even in the force in a hard to abate uh, industry. So we need to manage all this. And this is the picture I like to introduce just to see how we can consider and how we see the um, the 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 e fuels of course we should consider it and it has already has been already introduced by matteo biofuel biogas biomethane and see so the raw material the starting materials is completely different from what we are used to deal with and then we go to ethanol we go to advanced ethanol we go to middle cattle or something of this type depending on what the market will require of course and let, let me tell you that when you say conventional means uh, from uh, food crops more or less advanced is when you obtain the same material, the same product from waste biomass, typically um, uh, biomass based fisher crops will help us to reach a jet fuel, uh, a green jet fuels. On the other way, we have the hydrogen based fuel hydrogen, but essentially we do expect that water through electrolysis, so electricity, as already discussed, will be the, some, a need to bring to have this hydrogen, and maybe some, some, also some methane coming from some, some part of the electricity, is biomethane, will supply hydrogen in order to then give hydrogen or ammonia or the the, those who are more considered as typical e fuel, citating natural gas, sin fuel, which is again hydrogen and CO2 going to jet fuels or caseon resin and methanol. But here we need to have CO2. So CO2 from CCS or BEX, which is bioenergy uh, uh, CCS. Of course, also a direct air capture has to be included in the picture. Going a little bit into the more the detail, we see that uh, again at, uh, in the 50s, some uh, liquid fuels will be still available because in some cases, uh, the electricity or hydrogen himself cannot play the, the role for operational requirement, economic perspective or logistic limitation, particularly in aviation. So we still have some liquid fuels or biofuel. There is a lot of uh, bio, methane, or synthetic methane and hydrogen in the grid, and a significant contribution of the hydrogen in the total final consumption. So that is what is uh, indicated by EA as a, 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 a future route. Maybe here we could also got into the, some details of this uh, distribution. Uh, 
doesn't change the picture so much. I want to only to attract your attention on this uh, diagonal filled bar, which means that all these uh, additional increment uh, amount of uh, in this specific biodiesel, biokerosene required CCOS. So in some way they are still based on carbon, which has to be captured and managed. As here, if you saw it in the hydrogen, no hydrogen plot, uh, uh, in hydrogen chart, there is still some CCUS. So it means the, here there is still some carbon-based hydrogen that has to be made available to, to, the, to the market to satisfy all the hydrogen requests. So in, in, the, in a company, an oil gas company, we should be prepared or we should define our roadmap uh, in having all this uh, uh, in mind. Of course, uh, well, here we are not considering uh, wind and solar uh, energy production because it's a, a little uh, out of scope in the in the perspective. Only a little because if you see that energy is a key player in the in the future, and if it's green, renewable energy would be very much welcome. So here we go towards uh, the fuels. If you were to be placed in the what I call the CO2 frame, that say the CO2 circular economy. Today, CO2, its uh, usage is around 230 million tonnes. If we want to want to end a uh, couple of numbers, no? just to quantify, today, the amount of uh, CO2, which is going to be part of the CCS application, CCS project, is around 40 million. But we, 75, 85% are applied for enhanced oil recovery. So it's used to push out additional oil. No? To reach the target that uh, we, we want, uh, zero, the net zero emission, CCS need to be considered because the, 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 the number that uh, the, the market, the possible market here, and the amount of CO2 emitted by the, the mankind in his request for energy are not comparable. Uh, let's say that in the, in the, the rough calculation indicates in two, 2.5 gigatons per year, the amount of, energy, of CO2 that has to be managed or better storage you know, to reach the, the CO2 uh, zero emission target. And today, you see this 230 million ton basically are for urea and enhanced oil recovery. So what kind of conversion can we imagine for that? They are listed here, so we can go to fuels, and this is specifically the uh, part of our discussion. We can go to chemicals, and we can go to building material. So we need as an oil company, oil and gas company, we need to consider all these scenarios and taking advantage of all the situation, all the different market, all the different perspective, try to identify the better eh, roadmap towards 200, uh, 2050 eh, in this sense. I hope you understand the, the complexity of the picture that we have in front of us. And uh, let's, uh, so, making a step back and say, see what can we do with CO2, so how we can use this circular economy. I, 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 again, I'm grateful to Matteo because he has already introduced a lot of uh, basic concept that we, I, 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 I mentioned here, but just in a quick way. So we, if we have CO2 as a raw material, we need uh, to have input on energy for making CO2 to react. But as well, we have to consider the stability of CO2 in the product. This stability means how much time this CO2 molecules is retained in the product in which has been converted, because this is a part of the relative climate benefit. I tell you, I give you an example, which is very simple to understand. If we talk about uh, 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 CO2 cooled concrete, so cement material, you expect that the uh, stability of this CO2 material will be la uh, long-lasting. While with e-fuels, uh, 
maybe it's not so long. Maybe it depends on what you are converting, but in a shorter time, it will come out again. However, the market of fuel is expected to be much larger than maybe the market of polymer. So all these are factors that has to be uh, considered. I, or I'm, I mentioned also the market requirements. We have already touched by Matteo when they said the cost. Uh, let's see how it costs the CO2 route versus uh, the traditional route in terms of market acceptability, say methanol, for example. Methanol, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, it's well known that methanol price from, from CO2 um, hydrogenation is dominated by the transfer pile of hydrogen. So, and in this sense, it's much higher than the standard 450, 500 dollars per ton of, of, uh, of methanol. So in this sense, and on top of that, the overall efficiency, because if we spend more energy, so we emit more energy, more CO2 than the one to, to, to produce this kind of material with respect to CO2, used as a raw material, well, the, the deal is not good for the um, environment. So we have already seen that hydrogen is shifting a little bit to e-fuels. E uh, we have already seen this, that hydrogen is needed to upgrade CO2 with a, a loss of efficiency in terms of uh, a lot of um, loss of energy now available uh, the same plot that Matteo showed before, but uh, blue hydrogen in principle needs CO2 storage, otherwise we cannot, call, cannot be called defined blue, as well as the green hydrogen needs a very cheap renewable electricity. And again, we are here to what is uh, what I called hydrogen dilemma, use a ve as a vector or included into the product. I do believe that there is no a direct answer. It depends on the specific market, on the specific situation. So it's, a, it's difficult to make a direct choice. However, having said so, let's uh, come to the, a, a few slides uh, of application that try to summarize what we have been already said. And uh, we consider a couple of um, chain to, uh, for CO2 use. One is synthetic natural gas, uh, it's a hydrocarbon chain made of synthetic natural gas where you use four moles of hydrogen per moles of CO2, and as well as jet fuels, maybe the, 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 which is uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 and the root is the fissure drop, essentially hydrogen, CO2, then converted to CO2 and CO and hydrogen and, go, and then going through this field or the methanol chain, where you save a little bit on hydrogen, 25%, you can uh, put, for the time being, directly in some, uh, um, in some engines, spark-ignited engines, as gasoline blended, 15% in some cases today applied. It can be part of methane octane booster, MTB, you know, it's uh, the, the, you obtain MTB reacting methanol with isobutene and the synthetic gasoline, the methanol to gasoline technology developed uh, originally by ExxonMobil and then with a modern uh, a version of other tops uh, who built the plant recently in Turkmenistan of a significant amount of bar of gasoline per day. But methanol can open also the route to petrochemicals. And being Versalis, the, our chemical company, part of our group, you understand why in this specific case, methanol can be uh, more attractive than in other cases. And you see methanol here, maybe you, you, it's not easy for you to read this, this uh, plot, but you see that the, the, the main use of methanol, apart of as a solvent, is formaldehyde, acetic acid, the red is MTB, and this gray is methanol to olefin, the other conversion route uh, developed again from ExxonMobil uh, and so, some years ago, which it's very uh, applied, very much applied in China. Maybe not starting from 
methanol made of CO2, but this is another story. Um, let's go ahead, some example of that, maybe you are already aware that, uh, uh, for example, all Audi, the, 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 the uh, car company, the, uh, built uh, some years ago a uh, demonstrative plant in Werther in Germany using CO2 uh, from uh, biogas plant uh, and using electricity from the um, eolic power from North Sea to make this methane that then can be uh, uh, fuel, can fuel the, the, the appropriate uh, engines of their, um, their car. The, the, the plant was a demo because it was producing about 1,000 tons per year of synthetic natural gas. The other example I want to mention that uh, is, uh, again, most of you are maybe aware of that, the George Ola Renewable Methanol Plant, which is in, in operation since uh, more or less uh, 10 years in Iceland, which is producing a sort of methanol called Vulcanol, whose name, whose trade name should make you guess why uh, this name is and the specificity of this, uh, this situation. CO2 come from a, a natural sources because we are talking of a volcanic area and hydrogen from water electrolysis or electricity taken from geothermal power plant. So a particularly convenient solution to reduce the cost of production of methanol. No? And again, technology, and then I, I leave maybe Carlo to command this, but a traditional copper zinc aluminum catalyst used to, to, to for this conversion may be uh, uh, slightly modified to accommodate the larger amount of water produced. So we have some example of technology that can be applied. But since we talk a lot, and we are converting, as you know, I converting a couple of our refineries in Italy, Venezia and uh, Gela, into green refinery, uh, again, talking only fuels, I cannot skip giving just a few as light on this uh, on these topics. And uh, meaning saying that instead of oil, biomass should feed the uh, future refinery but they should be waste material in order not to compete with arable land dedicated to energy food crops, no? So there are a list of possible uh, raw material to be collected. The technologies are already there. Maybe they need to be fine-tuned to make more robust, to upgrade it, but you can, we can talk of thermochemical processes, we can talk of chemical processes, we can call chemical processes. All of them are there ready to go, no? But in any case, there are other couple of points that I need to underline. First, logistic of raw material collection and delivery. It's not so simple to have small production of this material and bring together to the refinery. And because it, in any case, is re this transportation requires some energy. The purification of raw materials, maybe you may say, okay, also the oil needs some purification, of course, but all we have to consider this different here, maybe phospholipids, for example, it's a typical example, because if you go for first lipids inside, then you have phosphorus going around and if it deposits on catalyst, it may kill the catalyst itself. And again, remember an overall energy balance and environmental impact, a sort of life cycle analysis of the initiatives should be always consider in order to understand if we are doing good or bad for the environment. So the reduction of the uh, uh, climate temperature increase. Last, uh, last uh, uh, slide before the short, of short conclusion. Uh, typically, you have heard and um, also from big competitor of us, they want to become a gas company. So methane seen, uh, seen as a bridge between today and the future. Why? Because, CO2, because methane is emitting less CO2 per unit of energy produced. So easier and cheaper to be treated. Providing that it's a, a good bridge, providing that 
the CO2 is well captured and well and appropriately managed. And we go back to what I we said before, but also the fugitive emission to be totally zeroed because methane and today in these days, this month, it's a very hot topic, the discussion of the impact of methane and particularly fugitive emissions uh, that uh, can be um, very, very negative uh, uh, on this, uh, on this, uh, on the um, climate uh, due to climate effect, due to his much higher global warming potential with respect to CO2. Uh, maybe some one of you have seen a, a recent uh, um, video on our TV dealing with exactly with this uh, point of fugitive emission of methane. Um, again, and then we come to the last uh, uh, slide. It's not a conclusion. Again, message to take away. We believe that uh, the fuels, e-fuels, are expected to, be, to play a role in the energy scenario. Different, but in this perspective, different raw materials can be considered. I maybe I repeat, by I rather prefer to say I reemphasize what Anatena has already said: biomass, CO2, preferably from biogenic or uh, origin or captured from here. Of course, here the cost is one big harder to overcome. Biomass converting technology are available, we said, but uh, if this is the case, we need to consider the bad, in this sense, companion of our energy system, CO2. We need to insert in a circular economy, which cannot avoid CCS. We cannot. Uh, it's, there are some restrictions, some concern, but in, indeed cannot be on all the CO2 can be converted. And we have already seen that uh, needs hydrogen CO2 to be converted, to be upgraded, but the transfer price of hydrogen needs to be going down very significantly to stay on the market. Uh, also the CO2 conversion, the hydrogenation technology are available. And I think Carlo will, take, uh, will tell us uh, a lot about this. Uh, maybe you need to find uh, a little bit fine tuning for CO2 stream. But basically, what is to have to be considered is the control of the uh, exothermicity of the uh, of the reaction that has to be controlled, uh, maybe efficiently integrated in this uh, in this uh, in, in, in the overall process scheme. Come to the, and of course the other is I use a high quality fuels uh, where only when and where energy or hydrogen is not directly usable. And with this uh, last point, I thank you all of you for your kind attention. And uh, I return the, the floor to Alessandra that I, I see in my little screen. Okay. From, uh, I know you have to disconnect. Uh, but uh, please come back from our for our round table because we want to push you a little bit more on ENI strategy. So see you okay. later. Uh, okay, I oh, will try to maintain my words and not be a Pinocchio. Okay, okay. We will come and get you. I'll try. To. <laughs> okay. Okay. See, see you later. See you. And thank you, uh, Stefano. See you. See you. Thanks. See you around five o'clock. More or less. Uh, yes, five o'clock. More Good. or less. Good. Okay. Okay. No. Sorry for that, but sorry for that, but it was an uh, a, a meeting I had to attend. Hmm? See okay. you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So now we can continue with Carlo, who has the challenge to maybe recover a few minutes. <laughs> Carlo is uh, from my same group the laboratory of catalysis and catalytic processes, and he will talk us about the key role of catalysis. I'm, I'm trying to share the screen.
which doesn't seem to work. I don't know if Stefan is still connected. You see the screen sharing mode is not working, apparently. Promotion rientrare? Anything? Okay, we should be ready. Okay, sorry for this issue. So good afternoon, everyone. It's Okay, here we go. So again, I cannot recover the time now. So, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real privilege for me to be here to contribute to this webinar with a talk uh, on the synthesis of e-fuels, which is one of my major research interests since many years. And for this reason, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity. Um, Today, I will try to address a couple of questions. First, if you Google uh, the word e-fuels, uh, you will find a lot of uh, fancy rendering uh, and um, many forecasts as well, somewhat contradictory. And so the first question is, uh, what is the actual technology readiness level for e-fuels? Second, uh, why is a heterogeneous catalysis the enabling factor uh, for the takeoff of e-fuels. I will try to answer those questions through three case studies, uh, which refer to, the, to three different e-fuels, uh, ammonia, methanol, and long-chain hydrocarbons. But before doing that, uh, let me make uh, a short step, step back uh, on the very fundamentals of e-fuels. So the first question is how to turn uh, renewable energy into fuels. And first of all, of course, we need to make hydrogen, which is the unique atom that all the fuels contain. And so the question is uh, where to make hydrogen from? And here the answer is pretty straightforward. In order to make hydrogen, uh, we need to find uh, uh, the water, which is very abundant on our planet. 70% of the world surface is covered by water. And also, hydrogen has the advantage that in addition to hydrogen, it contains oxygen, which can be eventually monetized, also considering that the water market is expected to grow at an annual growth rate of approximately 6% through 2029. Clearly, to make hydrogen out of water, exploiting renewable power, we need the electrolyzers. Uh, where the electrons are used to split uh, the very stable water molecule. Here, for the first time, catalysis uh, comes to light. And that's why electricity alone uh, is not enough to split water at a reasonable rate. So we need catalysts to accelerate the phenomenon. So through catalysis, uh, we can make the simplest e fuel, which is hydrogen, from water. And yesterday, we had uh, a very interesting seminar, and Alessandra mentioned that, uh, on the use of hydrogen for mobility. So I'm not going uh, uh, to recall aspects that have been discussed already yesterday, also because you can find the webinar online on YouTube. I just want to point out uh, one very important topic that has been discussed yesterday, and which is very relevant for e-fuels. 
hydrogen is a reality today. And Alstom, for example, is commercializing the world's first hydrogen train that has been specifically designed for operational operation on regional non-electrified lines. Already 41 trains have been sold, including some trains that will come to Italy and will be used on the Brescia Iseo Edolo railway, which is a 100 kilometer long railway, non-electrified, where nowadays uh, diesel trains are running. The hydrogen is so real and hydrogen-fueled vehicles are, are so real that these trains will become operational since 2024. So we are close to the real application of hydrogen. For all the applications where we can't use, you can't use hydrogen directly, heterogeneous catalysis allows us to transform hydrogen into a more conventional fuel. In order to do so, we need, first of all, a cheap co-reactant possibly with a negative cost. We have two options, as Matteo mentioned already, CO2 or nitrogen. CO2 is preferentially captured from point sources, such as the flue gases, for example, where CO2 is uh, highly concentrated. And I mean here uh, CO2 from flue gases from the hard to abate industries, as Stefano mentioned. CO2 can also come from biogas, as Matteo explained, while nitrogen comes from the air, which is a huge reservoir of concentrated nitrogen. Air, of course, as Matteo already shown, also contains CO2, which, however, is highly diluted. And so that's why we prefer to extract CO2 from flue gases where them are, are available. Said that, uh, once we have hydrogen and CO2 or nitrogen, we can use catalysis to make an e-fuel. And again, we have many options. We can make methane, which is quite simple to make and to transport, but which needs to be compressed or liquefied to have a sufficient energy density for mobility. We can make ammonia, that is also gas at room temperature and pressure, but is easier to be liquefied. Or we can make straight liquid fuels, such as methanol, or more conventional gasoline, diesel fuels, kero, jet fuels. All these fuels are of interest within the context of energy transition for mobility. Today, however, I would like to focus only on the most innovative e-fuels that, in my view, are ammonia, methanol, and long-chain hydrocarbons. So let's start with ammonia. First of all, I want to recall that ammonia is the second inorganic commodity produced worldwide after sulfuric acid. And 180 million tons per year of ammonia are produced worldwide, mostly starting from fossil sources, methane, and air. Here, the challenge is to replace methane as a source of hydrogen with water. Ammonia is particularly interesting as in e-fuels. In fact, it can either burn in internal combustion engine, it can be cycled back to hydrogen, releasing only nitrogen, and this makes ammonia a unique clean hydrogen uh, carrier. And last but not least, ammonia can be used directly in solid oxide fuel cells where ammonia is decomposed in the elements at the anode, the hydrogen molecule is then decomposed, releasing protons and electrons, and uh, those protons flow to the cathode where oxygen is reduced to water. So overall, we have, again, the oxidation reaction of ammonia making nitrogen and water, but here we are producing electricity instead of heat. In addition to that, of course, ammonia is interesting because, as we mentioned, is ready to be liquefied, can be simply stored as a liquid in refrigerated tanks, and due to the fact that, we are, that uh, since 100 of years we are dealing with ammonia for other scopes uh, other than uh, e-fuels, uh, 
we have infrastructure to transport via pipelines, rail cars, trucks, and ships uh, the ammonia. But let's come to the synthesis. Uh, the process for the synthesis of ammonia starts from the elements, uh, so from hydrogen from water electrolysis uh, and nitrogen from the air separation. The peculiarity of the ammonia synthesis, uh, and this is a very convenient peculiarity, is that uh, the ammonia synthesis reaction that we want to make in order to make uh, E ammonia, in order to make el um, electro ammonia, is exactly the same reaction that we are uh, running since many decades for the synthesis of fossil ammonia. So from a catalytic point of view, there is nothing um, to, to invent. And as a matter of fact, uh, e-ammonia has been manufactured from renewable energy for decades in Zimbabwe, for example, in Africa, where low-cost uh, uh, hydropower was available and ammonia was needed to make ammonium nitrate, a well-known fertilizer. The production in Zimbabwe of e-ammonia for agriculture was stopped only recently in 2015, due to the growth of the cost of electricity driven by the development of the country. And here I go back to what Matteo was saying on the necessity to have low-cost hydrogen to make e-fuels. What is new in the case of e-ammonia production, like in all the case of all the fuels, is the size of the plants, that due to the limited availability of renewable hydrogen, is at least uh, one order of magnitude lower than uh, in traditional uh, plants for the production of fossil ammonia. And this requires uh, new plant design in terms of catalytic reactor, which, however, seems uh, rather simple to make. At least this is what has been demonstrated by Siemens Energy recently, who is operating, as you can see in the slide, since 2019, a pilot plant uh, for the power to ammonia, which is a plant at TRL 7 or 8, able to produce 30 kilograms ammonia per day, starting from air and water. So in line with this premise, as you can see from the table reported in the slide, many companies have planned to install new power to ammonia commercial plants in the next five years. And so the message here is that renewable ammonia is going to become a reality very soon. Let's now move to methanol. Methanol is also a very important chemical. So it's one of the top 10 petrochemicals with a production of about 100 million tons per year, mostly from natural gas and for chemical applications. So its use is primarily in the chemical industry so far, but there are good reasons to consider methanol also as e-fuels. First of all, thanks to its very high octane number, methanol can be used in existing internal combustion engines based on Otto cycle as a replacement for gasoline. Also, methanol can be used as a hydrogen carrier within the so-called reformed methanol fuel cell. And in these cells, as you can see, methanol is first catalytically reformed to make hydrogen, and then hydrogen is used to run the cell, the fuel cell. And even more interesting, methanol can be used directly in dark methanol fuel cells, where electrocatalysts allow to transform its chemical energy into electric energy. In addition to that, again, as I already mentioned, methanol is very or relatively simple to transport and to store, and again, we have inst infrastructures and technology to do that. Let's come to the synthesis, how to make e-methanol. There are two major differences with respect to the production of e-ammonia. The first one, is that, uh, the, which is trivial, is that clearly when we have to make methanol, we need uh, CO2 as carbon carrier instead of uh, nitrogen as a nitrogen carrier. The second, which is less trivial, is that the, the catalytic synthesis we are interested in, in the case of the E-methanol production, starts from CO2, while the conventional methanol from fossil sources is produced 
basically starting from CO. And uh, if we want to utilize CO2 instead of CO, we have to take care about the competing reaction, which also occur in the system, which is the reverse water gas shift system, which brings CO mainly to form CO instead of making methanol. And here we have uh, another opportunity for catalysis, which is that of driving the selectivity of the process towards methanol instead of making uh, CO. The current technology readiness level of the e-methanol production is higher compared to ammonia, and Stefano Rossini has already shown us uh, what's the current status of the technology by showing us a picture of the George Ola renewable methanol plant, which is installed in Iceland, and Matteo has uh, explained us why this plant is in Iceland, which is the world's only e-methanol plant, uh, operational since 2011. And this plant is making 4,000 tons per year of renewable methanol, exploiting uh, the renewable energy from the Icelandic grid, and now we know why they have this renewable energy in the grid, exploiting also the CO2 coming from a nearby geothermal power station. So here they have uh, the right conditions to operate the plant. But this is not, all, this is not a unique place to make e-methanol as an e-fuel. And in fact, in this table, you can see all the projects that have been, that are in the pipeline, which scale from a few to 100 kilotons per year. Making e-methanol, starting from biogenic CO2, industrial CO2, that are capturing municipal solid waste. So all the sources we have discussed so far. So also e-methanol is a reality, and it's a reality that will come online very soon. The third case study I want to briefly show you is that of the so-called Fischer-Tropsch fuels, which is not in this case one single molecule, but is a family of mixtures, chemical identical to naphtha, to kerosene, to diesel, to base oil. FT fuels are a reality today, but again, they are made using carbon from fossil sources, as well as hydrogen from fossil sources, mostly from methane and coal. So here the idea is that of replacing those fossil sources with CO2 and water. FTE fuels are particularly interesting because they are drop-in fuels in the sense that they can be used in existing internal combustion engines, either auto cycle based or diesel cycle based, as substitute or blended with gasoline or diesel. In addition to that, they are cleaner than the oil equivalent fuels because they don't contain sulfur and aromatics. Very important is this third point. They have a high level of popular acceptance because the technological transformation from fossil hydrocarbons to renewable hydrocarbons is made upstream from the consumer. So consumer does not pay for the transition from fossil to renewable. And also, last but not least, if you are from FT, are the only possible option at the moment to close the emission gap in the aviation sector. That said, we have different options to make FT products out of hydrogen and CO2. The first one, and the more conventional, is that of uh, converting CO2 and hydrogen into syngas first, uh, using uh, a reverse water gas shift catalytic reactor, and then converting the syngas into a conventional fischer tropsch plant. The alternative is that of making a one-pot reaction and converting in a single unit CO2 and hydrogen into syn crude. At the moment, the Eindritt route, so the first one I've presented, is a favored 
on the direct route because it uh, exploits uh, optimized processes. Each step, the reverse water gas shift step and the FT step can occur at optimized process condition and eventually we can remove water between one reactor and the other. And as a matter of fact, uh, at the moment we have plant with a rather high TRL which are making renewable EFT fuels starting from CO2 and hydrogen. And here I'm briefly presenting you the plant built by Sunfire in collaboration with Audi which makes uh, uh, gasoline and diesel out of CO2 and hydrogen. The size of the plant is one barrel per day. Announcements have been also recently reported for the commercial development at TRL 9 on the, of the same technologies. And here I've reported as example the case of Nordic Electrofuels who is planning to install a 8,000 ton per year plant in the Heroya Technological Park in Norway. To be honest, there is a third alternative which is viable to make FT products which is that of exploiting the co-electrolysis of CO2 and hydrogen. So in this unit, CO2 and water are electrolyzed at the same time forming syngas and then syngas is used in a conventional FT plant. And again, there are uh, proof of concept at relevant scale of, the, of this concept and here I'm presenting you the Copernicus Power 2X demo plant, again installed from, by Sunfire and other companies, where 10 liters of syncrude per day are made out of CO2 and water exploiting a co-electrolysis followed by a conventional Fischer-Tropsch plant. And also in this case, announcements have been reported for commercial scale plants in the next few years. And here I am presenting you the case of Norsk e-fuel, which in the same site seen for uh, Nordic electrofuels, so in the same technological park uh, in Norway, they want to install a plant with the same capacity, 8,000 tons uh, FT fuels per year, uh, produced from CO2, from direct air capturing, and hydropower. So the take-home messages. Behind all the fancy rendering and forecasts, uh, there is a true revolution which is coming called e-fuels. Industrialization is in the pipeline. And as I have shown you today, many plants are expected in the next five to 10 years. There won't be a single winning e-fuels which will lead the market. All of them will play a significant role for different applications. Very important is the fact that uh, almost all the fuels uh, have many applications also in the chemical industry, which means that developing e-fuels for mobility means also producing molecules which can decarbonize the chemical industry, which is another important aspect to be considered today. Last but not least, uh, to make e-fuels competitive, as the previous speakers have discussed, we need to make uh, lower the cost of hydrogen but even more important than that, we have to develop optimized conversion processes and in this framework, catalysis play really a key role in my view. Thank you for your kind attention. A very, very interesting uh, talk. We are a little bit later uh, than our schedule, but we are now in, in charge of, uh, of a break. So let's meet again at uh, 15 to 5. Okay. Thank you for the kind attention. Okay, I think we can start uh, again with our second session. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce.
introduce to you Galina Skorikova from TNO, researcher, and uh, her contribution is entitled Synthesis Roots for Carbon-Based Climate-Neutral uh, uh, Fuels uh, Pilot Activities. So thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandra. It was just to check uh, if the microphone is working. But uh, good afternoon, dear audience, and everyone who is joining us online. By the way, I cannot see you, but I hope you're also following. Uh, and today, um, I would like to talk to you about the carbon-based climate neutral fuels, the synthesis routes that we're exploring, and the pilot activities that are currently in place at our organization. So firstly, I would like to take some time to introduce you to TNO and uh, the issues that we are targeting to solve. Uh, then I would like to give you a few examples on sustainable fuels and their value and on the projects that we are working on and the pilot installations that we built. First of all, TNO stands for the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research with the stress on applied. Uh, we comprise the several departments and targeting different societally relevant problems, among which is energy transition unit. You can see that the departments are distributed all over the country, and the energy transition unit is located basically in Amsterdam, Delft, Utrecht, and Patten. I personally work in Patten, so I'm going to represent my own team today. Um, within energy transition unit, we are trying to search for innovative solutions uh, for different aspects. For example, renewable energy sources like uh, solar energy, wind energy, and uh, sustainable process and energy systems, heat transfer and fluid dynamics, CO2 capture, and how you actually store CO2 after you captured it. So subsurface storage. It has to be modeled um, by collecting the geodata and uh, uh, modeling. Sustainable technology and industrial process department uh, comprises several uh, research directions. Um, for example, how you um, produce uh, industrial heat or how you provide the electrochemical separation and conversion, how you process the waste gas stream or how you separate uh, several liquids and how you remove CO2 from the liquids, for example. Many projects are early development projects, therefore they require the fundamental research. And for this purpose, we strongly collaborate with the universities and, and uh, different research organizations. Additionally, our main focus is actually to develop technology, scale it up and implement in industry. And for that, we need a collaboration with the business partners that you can see on the slide. So first of all, uh, yeah, in the past years, we actually joined the forces to defossilize most of the industries. And we succeeded a little bit. And of course, we're ambitious to succeed even more. However, the transport sector has not improved at all. Uh, you know, uh, society becomes more mobile and we require more and more transport and we like to use planes, for example, because it's very convenient. And you see that demand is growing and currently the European energy consumption in transport sector is 32%. This is quite a lot. And you can see that in the past 30 years, the greenhouse gas emissions have reached 25% and they were 15% in 1990. So it's growing. And my colleagues um, from the Strategic Business uh, Analysis Department, they um, did some research on the implementation plan of the scenarios for the future. So they see the urgent research needs to be done in uh, development of e-fuels, R&D, development of the pilot plants, and uh, transport pilots and uh, biokerosene. Yeah? So this is urgent. It's already happening right now. So soon after, we need to modify the engines and the fuel cell development. Um, also focus on transport pilots. And of course, what is important, it needs to be supported by European regulation, certification, and eventually expanding the infrastructure. Yeah? And of course, 
We have talked a lot about green hydrogen today. This is essential for e-fuels, so we need to scale up green hydrogen production and uh, accordingly expand renewable energy supply. For the more information, of course, you can check uh, the reference. So first of all, they say that you need to repeat three times in order to remember. So I hope that you already remember that e-fuels uh, are made from the captured CO2 and uh, green hydrogen. And hydrogen is called green when it's produced by an electrolysis process, which is uh, powered by renewable energy source like wind, solar, nuclear, and others. We also call the fuels bio-based when the carbon species together with the hydrogen mixture are produced thermochem thermochemically from the biomass, for example, by gasification. Uh, and then the deficiency of hydrogen is also compensated by the hydrogen from the electrolyzer. Once you have a hydrogen and you have the captured CO2, you can produce a portfolio of carbon-based fuels, such as, again, methanol, diesel, liquid natural gas, e kerosene. Also, it's important to remember that hydrogen on its own is a fuel. And when you combine hydrogen with uh, nitrogen, it's ammonia, which we've learned today is a very promising fuel um, as well. What I would like to highlight here is when you convert, when you hydrogenate CO2, the essential byproduct is water. So we produce hydrogen from water, and then we lose half of the, roughly half of the hydrogen in water. So water balance is critically important. And another aspect is what we've learned today is that green hydrogen is expensive and scarce. So what we need to do, we need to intensify the processes in order to maximize this hydrogen conversion so we lose less. How we do it at our organization? So here you see different fuels. And of course, different fuels have different values. First of all, different energy density. Second of all, they are suitable for different applications. And uh, important to note that if you use um, essential for the heavy whole road transport and for the aviation, uh, because local transport can be also electrical sometimes, but it's another discussion. Uh, here you can see that, uh, for example, hydrogen, e-methanol, e-diesel, and liquid natural gas, they are feasible for the trucks and for shipping. When? Uh, aviation requires kerosene, and this is the only feasible option for now. I'm going to focus a lot on methanol and dimethyl ether, and what are their benefits is they have high potential to minimize climate impact, they require minimal vehicle adjustment, and they already can use the existing fuel infrastructure. So this is very beneficial. First of all, I would like to focus on our key expertise, I would say, uh, which is called sorption enhancement. So here you can see the graph. Uh, it represents uh, the steam uh, partial pressure and the mole fraction of the product. So when there is a reaction of CO2 hydrogenation, the essential product is water that we've learned. But uh, the study shows that in reduced steam partial pressure, so in dry conditions, the mole fraction of product significantly increased. So sometimes two orders of magnitude, like for the methanol and for DME, you can see how much the conversion improves in dry conditions. So what we can do is we can remove water in situ, and therefore we can intensify the process. This process is called steam sorption enhancement. And it can be done by either sorbents or membranes. Uh, so first of all, with the membrane, how it basically works. So you have your reactor and uh, you have your membrane uh, module inside. So uh, the catalyst is placed here in the shell and the uh, CO2 and hydrogen, they react on the catalyst producing uh, the carbon species and water. When the membrane is selective, water permeates through the membrane and collected on the permeate side. What is the driving force for that? Is the difference in partial pressure of steam. Then how we can enhance it? We either can condense water on the permeate side using the cold finger, for example, or we can use the sweep gas. Then 
um, the driving force is increased. What is the challenge here is the perm selectivity. The membrane has to be very selective. Otherwise, if, uh, if your carbon species permeate as well, there is, there, it will be very difficult to separate it from water later, sometimes. For example, methanol. Another option would be to use sorbent component. Yeah, when we mix sorbent to the catalyst bed, then the sorbent is able to absorb water in situ. But once it's saturated, it needs to be regenerated. So you already can see this process is cyclic. It's not uh, continuous. Uh, and this cycle of uh, absorption and regeneration we normally call temperature pressure swing absorption. Why temperature pressure swing? Because uh, absorption quite often happens at high pressure. And in order to let the water desorb, you would like to reduce the pressure. And then you make a pressure swing. Um, if you want to make this process continuous, you need a battery of uh, different reactors, right? So they, um, for example, this is absorption step, this is uh, depressurization, blowdown step, and purge step, and repressurization step. All of them have their own function. So you can see when the first column is done with absorption, the second one is switched on, and then the third one, and the, the product is continuously collected. Uh, while the previous column is under regeneration. Pressure is reduced to let the water desorb. After that, the purge, we purge with the dry gas, basically to remove desorb water, and then we increase pressure again. And this is the most simplistic cycle. What is the challenge about it is, first of all, uh, the sorbent should have a high sorption capacity. It will determine your performance. And the second one is heat managing. Heat management can be uh, very challenging. So now I would like to give you a few examples on carbon-based fuels. And the most basic one is uh, carbon monoxide, right? So this is the most simple molecule that you can produce from CO2. And as Carlo mentioned, that it's uh, called, uh, the reaction is called reverse water gas shift. And uh, this is equilibrium limited reaction. And uh, since it's equilibrium limited and endothermic, it actually requires quite high temperatures, about 800 degrees which is quite a significant heat demand. And uh, how can you intensify it again is if you in situ remove water, according to Le Chatelier principle, you shift the equilibrium to the product side. So your conversion goes over the thermodynamic uh, equilibrium. And basically, then you can make this uh, reaction at much lower temperatures. And we have demonstrated this reaction at 300 degrees which is about three times lower. And believe me, this is a big improvement. Mm. Why it is possible that you can see we developed the bifunctional reactive sorbent. So they have two functions. First, catalytic function, like platinum or copper, they catalyze reverse water gas shift. And zeolites, like 4A or 13X, they absorb water. And it's all happening in one particle. That's why it's called bifunctional material. So we have published the results, and you can see this is sorption enhancement. So this is thermodynamic equilibrium. This is, is supposed to be your outlet flow. But you go much beyond that at the beginning when it's dry, the column is dry. As soon as you get the water breakthrough, then your conversion drops to the equilibrium again. Yeah? So all of this area below, this is intensified process. And you can see that selectivity towards carbon monoxide is almost reaching 90%. This is unbelievably high. So then your separation afterwards can be simplified. Um, as was mentioned before, that carbon monoxide is a perfect fuel uh, for fissure drops. Then we also only miss hydrogen. If we feed the surplus of hydrogen, then we have a proper syngas mixture. Yeah? And then we can continue with fissure drops and uh, short or long chain hydrocarbons, which can be used as kerosene. And for that, we have recently formed a consortium uh, to produce avi sustainable aviation fuels. And we are going to use uh, this pilot, which is about two meters high. It's a high throughput reactor. And you can demonstrate your technology at uh, uh, technology readiness level of four. The next platform chemical and actually a fuel on its own is methanol. 
And uh, we have a few projects um, running around Metanol. And this one is called Converge. Here we are part of a big consortium. And um, the idea of the project is to produce biodiesel from agricultural waste. How does it happen? You can see the flow scheme. So basically, the waste feedstock is first gasified, the gas is cleaned, then it's followed by a reforming unit and the membrane reactor, EMM, enhanced membrane methanol reactor. After that, the methanol is converted to biodiesel. And here again, you can see that CO2 is hydrogenated and formed methanol, and water is removed by means of membrane, and the process is intensified. Um, this project is called Converge, and um, it uses the polyimide membrane. It's about 70 to uh, 90 centimeters length, so it's quite a pilot that we designed. And here you can see that uh, before the membrane reactor, there is a packed bed, packed bed reactor, uh, the mass flow controllers, the analytical equipment here, and thermal controls. So that's how it, it was designed with the targeted conversion per pass, uh, 33%. And that's how it looks in real life. This is your tubular membrane reactor, uh, basically membrane. And um, several membranes are packed in one shell, shell and tube. And then after thermal insulation, you come up with such <laughs> shiny uh, installation, which is containerized. We are ready to demonstrate the process at a readiness level of five. Uh, currently, it has passed the cold commissioning and ready for hot commissioning. And so we are ready to scale up. Uh, the next molecule, uh, which uh, Matteo said that I would uh, highlight, is basically dimethyl ether. Uh, what is dimethyl ether? If you hydrogenate, if you dehydrate two methanol molecules, you form dimethyl ether. So here you can see a simple reaction of uh, CO2 hydrogenation, but actually it happens in two sequential steps. The first step, you form methanol on traditional copper zinc react, uh, catalyst. And after that, you use gamma alumina in order to remove a water molecule and form dimethyl ether. You can spot that it has a higher energy density than methanol, and it has a similar physical chemical characteristics as diesel. So it can be used as an alternative to diesel. Um, here, I'm mentioning the fledged project uh, that we have been working on together with Polymi. Uh, and the source was the biomass. So after the gasification, you can see you have different carbon species, and uh, optionally you can add uh, hydrogen or not. We use this pilot. The pilot is pretty big. It's six reactors of six meters high, and we have demonstrated 1,000 full cycles without significant degradation, with a selectivity close to 95%. This is uh, quite high. I'm very proud of my colleagues. And uh, yeah, we also use this pilot for different uh, pressure swing adsorption uh, technologies. The next project on dimethyl ether is uh, called E2C, which stands for electrons to chemicals. And it targets the 2C region, which, which involves England, Netherlands, Belgium, and the coast of France. And to see how we can utilize this offshore electricity, renewable electricity, to produce hydrogen and then e-fuels from the hydrogen. You can see the concept is uh, similar, electricity, electrolysis, hydrogen comes, meets CO2, then we produce DME. We have designed the pilot of 7.5 meters tall, three reactors, and each of them has the capacity of 150 liters. It's three shell and tube reactors. This reactor has currently been built and is ready to be transported to the, our patent site. So basically, end of October, we are ready for the hot commissioning. Their projected production rate is about three kilograms an hour of DME, uh, which is good uh, for the pilot. But after that, the plan is to transport, I will go further, after that, the plan is to transport the pilot to the uh, field lab for industrial electrification. 
in order to use it for different purposes and demonstrate different um, pressure swing. Um, yeah, basically pressure swing absorption technologies. So we are going to use it for uh, to scale it up for power tweaks, to handle the industrial gases and bio-based uh, gases. We have also did the business case study. So I really liked uh, the talk from Matteo on, um, yeah, it is clear that uh, electricity price plays the major role in e-fuels cost. You can see here the breakdown cost of levelized uh, DME. So this is the, uh, the market, the current market cost. Here you can see the electricity contribution, which is huge. The next one is CAPEX for PEM electrolyzer and after that CO2 capture. So what were our assumption is 40 uh, euro per megawatt hour and 70 euro per ton of CO2 capture cost, which is quite uh, reasonable. Uh, and we came up with a production cost of 1.3 euro per kilogram of DME, which is about 10 cen cents less than if you use a uh, traditional uh, DME reactor, uh, which is already quite promising. But further on, uh, you can see already the familiar graph that if you go to the lower price of electricity and lower cost for CO2 capture, you can achieve even lower cost of e-fuels. Uh, if you would like to get more details, please go to the um, and read the paper. I'm trying to see what I need to highlight here. Uh, it's very so it's very sensitive. If um, I would like to point out what are the main points for development here. First of all, to in increase the efficiency of PEM electrolyzer, it is expensive, so it should work well. Second of all, we all hope that the electricity price will drop. And, uh, of course, we are all uh, trying to make uh, CO2 capture units cheaper. Um, in conclusion, I would like to say that the main contributor, yeah, electricity course, cost, therefore, the green hydrogen is very expensive, and uh, we should use the process intensification in order to maximize hydrogen conversion. And the point that I would like to pick up uh, from... Um, I think uh, it was uh, Carlo uh, Stefano who mentioned it, that the market will be very diverse. Every fuel will find its own application. So we need to develop several technologies in parallel. And for example, uh, it, it cannot be not only fuel. Methanol is a good platform chemical. You can use MTO root, which was mentioned earlier, in order to produce ethylene, propylene, aromatics, and then go to plastics. So it's very versatile and um, the technology can be ut utilized for different purposes. Then I took a note that I would like to comment on the electricity cost that maybe we should turn, we should ramp up the plant only when the electricity cost is low. But then we need to keep in mind that uh, the production hours will be significantly reduced. And then the capex will play a much uh, more pronounced role and in this case it's a balance because when you operate it not that often then of course your payback period will be uh, significantly increased and if your lifetime is limited then you will see uh, this cost influence in that. Uh, I think I would like to conclude with that. Uh, we are trying to collaborate with the universities uh, applying for the project so if you have great ideas uh, you are welcome to contact us and we will be happy to scale it up and implement. Kalina, thank you very much. Very, very inspiring talk. Uh, now, it's time to listen to the contribution from uh, Professor Tommaso Lucchini from the Department of Energy. Internal Combustion Engines Group, and his talk is entitled uh, E-Fuels for Clean and Highly Efficient Internal Combustion Engines. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Alessandro, for your kind introduction. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This uh, presentation uh, will discuss uh, the potential of uh, e-fuels uh, in uh, the different applications uh, of uh, internal combustion engines. I would like to start uh, to comment uh, about the recently proposed FIT 455 package, which uh, uh, sets uh, a target for uh, carbon dioxide reduction in uh, United Europe by 2030. Such a uh, uh, package uh, um, sets uh, uh, tight limitations for greenhouse gas emissions in the mobility sector. In particular, by 2030, uh, uh, cars should reduce their tailpipe CO2 emissions by 55%, and only zero tailpipe emissions will be allowed by 2035. 30% reduction in CO2 emissions is expected for trucks by 2030, and uh, maritime transport will be possible only with the low carbon fuels. Different studies have been performed in the past, basically to understand how the different scenario of a fully decarbonized transport should look like. And uh, for example, in this study, which has been done by DEMA, it is possible to see that uh, even in the most uh, electrified scenario with a very aggressive electrification strategy, 70% energy demand for mobility will be still covered by liquid fuel in 2050, and also, the EU transport energy demands for renewable energy electricity in 2050 may exceed the current EU electricity production by a factor of 1.7 to 3, depending on the scenario that we are considering. Moreover, forecasts illustrate that the European Union battery capacity production by 2030 will not be able to cover the request of at least 55% battery electric vehicles to be sold. And this is the reason why, for example, Concawe suggests to find, rather than only BEV vehicles, an optimal mix between hybrid electric, plug-in electric, and battery electric vehicles to um, reduce the CO2 emissions from passenger cars. Uh, E-fuels could be a very interesting solution for the decarbonization of the mobility, mainly in all the sectors which are complicated to electrify and decarbonize. The most uh, interesting uh, E-fuels are liquefied D-methane, methanol, ammonia, hydrogen, DMC and MIFO, Fischer trough fuels, and dimethylether. In terms of uh, liquefied uh, E-methane can be produced by the so-called methanation process, uh, in which uh, hydrogen and uh, carbon dioxide are joined, and uh, the, this pro process produces water and the gas. And uh, the combined use of liquefied uh, in methane and uh, um, biogas could be a very useful solution for the decarbonization of uh, the heavy-duty road transport sectors. In particular, natural gas engines are now used in trucks, with different combustion technologies like spark ignition stoichiometric, spark ignition lean barn, dual fuel premise combustion, and dual fuel diffusive combustion. Natural gas engines offer advantages in terms of uh, reduction of uh, particle emissions, no sulfur emission, and better control of NOx emission in spark ignition engines thanks to the use of the three-way catalyst. However, it is still necessary to increase the efficiency of natural gas engines to reach values typical of diesel engine, and also it's important to handle the problem of the slip since methane has a high GWP. In terms of engine technology that can be beneficial for natural gas engine, I think that active pre-chamber combustion could be very useful because the stoichiometric mixture of air and fuel is ignited in a small pre-chamber, and then hot fuel, hot jets enters the main combustion chamber and propagates the flame in a lean mixture. Such technology has the advantage to increase the engine efficiency, to extend the lean limits thanks to higher combustion stability, and also to reduce NOx, CO, and AC emissions. This paper also, is, uh, this recent paper demonstrates the advantage of such technology over conventional spark ignition uh, technology, mainly with uh, showing that uh, with the turbo jet ignition, it is possible to operate uh, this uh, constant uh, volume vessel at uh, equivalence ratio value that are close to two. And uh, even investigations done in combination recently by Lund University and CNR stems 
from Italy, demonstrated the capability to operate a natural gas engine with the turbo jet ignition at a relative equivalence ratio values of about two. CFT simulations are clearly necessary to improve uh, the combustion technology, and this is a picture that is showing uh, CFD simulation performed by our group with our in-house code device of the turbulent jet ignition and the combined analysis of the flame propagation and combustion regimes can really help uh, the development of uh, such complex uh, combustion systems. Methanol is uh, a very interesting fuel because uh, it can be also produced uh, or directly from uh, electricity by atmospheric CO2 and uh, hydrogen from hydrolysis, but also from uh, methanol, from uh, biomass, and uh, from syngas. Besides uh, LNG, methanol is one of the most promising alternative fuels for shipping because it is already available in ports, is biodegradable, and uh, it uh, has a very high solubility in water. It has a relatively high energy density, and so it's a very good uh, hydrogen carrier. Moreover, it is, uh, it, has, it is one of the hydrocarbons with the highest uh, laminar flame speed. The combustion in uh, methanol engines has been uh, studied uh, for a, let's say, very long time, and uh, this paper illustrates uh, that uh, a dedicated methanol engine can operate uh, with a compression ratio that uh, arrives at 19.5, which is a really very high value compared to the one of diesel engine, but this is a spark ignition engine and also combination of turbocharging, load control with EGR, and stoichiometric operation allows uh, an, uh, mm, to reach a maximum efficiency of 42% and a 90% reduction of NOx with the increased resistance of pre-ignition that methanol offers in combination with EGR. In terms of operation on marine engines, spark ignition uh, methanol engine has been recently tested in, uh, by the University of Aachen that tried to verify the capability for uh, methanol to um, produce in large bore engine the same advantages of uh, small spark ignition engine. And uh, what we can see is that from uh, this uh, investigation, it is possible to operate uh, methanol engine with a relative air fuel ratio of 1.7, allowing uh, NOx emission below the limitation from IMO. The achieved 44% brake thermal efficiency clearly confirms the potential of uh, methanol for large bore engine. However, problems arise because it's necessary to control the formaldehyde emissions by mm, an oxidizer catalyst. Methanol, thanks to its high octane number, offers a better response during transients compared to LNG. Another possibility to operate methanol in marine engine is by the so-called fumigation in which uh, the methanol or any other fuel is injected into the intake system and then the homogeneous mixture is uh, ignited by a diesel injection towards the end of the compression stroke. The, let's say, major fumigation is about 50% gaseous injection, minor fumigation, when less than 50% gaseous injection is uh, used. The fumigation ratio is limited by the engine load, uh, so it's possible to operate the engine with the different fumigation ratio at different loads, because uh, this is mainly limited by combustion stability, for example, and uh, by NOx. It's possible to see that the increase in the fumigation ratio in a dual fuel engine clearly increases also the ignition delay and also makes the heat release rate shape more closer to the one of a spark ignition engine. In terms of emissions, even a fumigated engine offers reduced NOx and soot emissions compared to pure diesel, but still it seems to be necessary to control the formaldehyde emissions. Some research has been done by our research group in collaboration with uh, the research group from the University of Ghent on the study of a dual fuel fumigated methanol engine and uh, the analysis of the flame propagation by CFD simulation was, uh, let's say, possible, made possible to identify the factors that can allow such engine to operate with a high fumigation ratio. Ammonia has also a potential to be a fuel for marine transport, as uh, uh, Carlo also uh, discussed before, 
the problem of ammonia is not uh, for sure the energy density, it's not the infrastructure that can even mitigate most of the hydrogen drawbacks, but uh, is uh, the property of ammonia because uh, it has a very low laminar flame speed, which means that it uh, cannot be burned alone in spark ignition engine, and also the cetane number is only equal to three, so pure ammonia cannot be used in compression ignition engines. There are dedicated to combustion concepts for ammonia engine, like the one in the picture, that uh, combines HCCI and compression ignition combustion. However, another possibility for burning ammonia in engine is uh, by dual fuel combustion as MN energy solution plants uh, to do by 2024. In particular, what it will happen is that uh, a pilot uh, diesel injection and then ammonia will be injected in a row so that uh, in this way it will be possible to burn even fuel with a very low cetane number in a diffusive mode and such concept uh, has been uh, even uh, simulated uh, by our group uh, in a LNG diesel uh, marine engine a uh, few years ago, as you can see in the movie. About uh, spark ignition engines, uh, we can see that uh, there are different options for uh, liquid fuels besides methanol, and in particular, we can see DMC, dimethyl carbonate and MIFO, methyl formate. Such two fuels, uh, compared to gasoline, has a very high oxygen content in the molecule and a very high octane number, which means uh, that uh, once they are used, uh, in uh, engines, uh, they have the chance to reduce PM emissions and also to increase the efficiency. We can, uh, both these fuels can be produced by methanol, so they can be somehow indirectly e-fuels. And uh, here we can see that uh, we can run uh, spark ignition engines uh, with uh, pure DMC or MIFO, reaching uh, performances uh, that are comparable to the ones uh, of uh, uh, conventional gasoline engines, uh, but uh, with uh, reduced uh, PN emissions. But uh, the interesting part is that uh, such two fuels can be even blended. And uh, once uh, used uh, in the engine, they can uh, offer an increase of efficiency of even more than 10%, mainly at high load, and a reduction of particle emission that uh, fall even below the ambient level. So very, very low, but also reduction also is offered in terms of CO and NOx emissions. Synthetic gasoline is also another possibility, which is very interesting because it can reduce the uh, carbon dioxide emissions also of the current uh, car fleet, not only for new cars. And this was the, and the methanol to gasoline process for Fisher Trop technology are two possible solutions for that. In particular, if we look uh, at uh, the efforts that has been uh, recently done uh, by mainly Porsche, it was to develop uh, a carbon neutral synthetic fuel that uh, is already compliant with the current standards of Eu European gasoline. So all the existing cars uh, can use it without any modification, and also new engines can fully benefit from the fuel improvements. However, the design of a fuel for a spark ignition engine is very complex because it must produce optimal fuel air mixing, producing an homogeneous mixture at the combustion event, regular combustion without misfire or knock, and limited emissions in terms of soot, CO, and unburned hydrocarbons. So Porsche has done recently a very important work on the definition of a EU-compliant fuel by testing a very large number of formulations on a single cylinder engine and uh, even optimizing the map of the engine accordingly. This paper illustrates all the methodology, so if you are interested, please read them because there is a fantastic, uh, let's say, job on uh, engine development and engine testing, and in particular, They've tested 20 fuel formulations and then identified the most promising ones that uh, were then uh, even tested on the chassis dyno for two different cars uh, that uh, have different ages uh, to see how they perform even in existing cars. So we can see these uh, synthetic fuels uh, proposed by Porsche. They produce generally reduction of fuel consumption, reduction of uh, particle emissions, uh, and uh, increase the combustion stability, so 
let's say they are very promising, but also it's interesting to see that even in very old cars like the 993 from 1998, emissions are reduced compared to the emissions with the standard gasoline, which means that there is a great potential for low emission fuels to help existing vehicles to meet increasingly stringent emission limits. For what concerns compression ignition engines, there are also possibilities like dimethyliter, uh, OME, fischer tropsch diesel fuel. I will just focus on OME because the next talk will extensively discuss DME. OME is still produced from methanol and DME, and then there is uh, these uh, uh, further uh, processes that uh, converts DME to OME, and OME can have <coughs> different chain lengths, and uh, in particular, some tests were performed to evaluate OME versus HVO. HVO is a hydrogenated vegetable oil. OME has increased the cetane number when increasing the chain length, and the, the large amount of oxygen in the molecule allows actually uh, an almost soot-free combustion. The problem is that uh, the stoichiometric air fuel ratio is much lower than the one of diesel fuel, so it's necessary to adapt the injection system. Results in a single cylinder engine demonstrates that the OME is very promising because it can reduce NOx compared to even HVO and not only diesel, because it can tolerate higher levels of EGR. Particle emissions are always below the ambient level, but however, it's not possible to uh, run with the EGR so high to allow a stoichiometric combustion. Some work has been also done to test OME versus diesel, and uh, this is just a blend of different uh, OME chains. Uh, I would say that uh, even in using a, let's say, optimized and dedicated injection system, OME performs even better, and uh, some work has been done also by our group on OME combustion, in particular in collaboration with the University of Valencia with CMT, in order to understand, uh, uh, let's say, how combustion chamber should be changed to maximize efficiency and minimize emissions on OME engines. Of course, e-fuel can benefit from advanced engine technologies like HPDI. This is a direct injection, uh, uh, double injection of uh, diesel and uh, a low reactivity fuel. This is the technology that allows efficiency of natural gas engines comparable to diesel, and it's suitable also for hydrogen, methanol, and ammonia. RCCA combustion, where a homogeneous low reactivity mixture is ignited by a diesel pilot, has the possibility to reach 50% efficiency, and it could be also applied with ammonia, methanol, natural gas, and hydrogen, it has been also already tested, and also there are different engine concepts of high efficiency, like the free piston or post-piston engine and recuperated split cycle, where e-fuels can operate with efficiency that are claimed to be almost to 60%. The internal combustion engine group is doing research on aspects related on e-fuels. In particular, there is a joint PhD project on the combustion of carbon neutral fuel with the PhD candidate, who is Andreas Kirru, who is developing kinetic mechanisms and combustion models for well-to-wheels carbon neutral fuel. But uh, there is also work on the modeling of the fuel air mixing process and the study of advanced combustion modes such as premixed in combustion and RCCI combustion. Coming to the conclusion, or how people now like to call it a takeaway or something like that, Liquid fuels will cover a large amount of energy needs for mobility for many years to come. And the uh, fuels uh, are a carbon neutral technology, so they have a potential for a reduction of CO2 and pollutants. Consolidated production processes, as also Carlo has illustrated, and availability of a distribution infrastructure. E fuels can ve be very beneficial for internal combustion energy because they offer contemporary reduction of CO2 and emissions, removing uh, many constraints uh, that are nowadays affecting the engine design and calibration. And also, they can be beneficial not only for new vehicles, but for legacy ones. 
I think that for internal combustion energy research, personally, things must change in the future. We need, in any case, to consider that battery electric vehicles are absolutely needed for the decarbonization. And uh, I think uh, all the energy community should start to forget that internal combustion engines uh, are only cars. And the battery electric vehicles will not, uh, let's say, set an end to internal combustion engines because they will produce, they are, they are devices that produce power, that produce energy, and they will have a crucial role in a decarbonation, decarbonation scenario with variable renewal, renewable energy where energy storage is needed at different scale. And energy research is needed considering the new application than the use of e-fuel. And finally, I would like to comment on the fact that, to my opinion, regulations that are currently based only on tailpipe CO2 emissions are now out of date, considering the possibility to produce carbon neutral fuel from renewable energy. And I would say that the technology neutrality is not an hurdle, as maybe someone thinks, but a strong advantage to reach the decarbonization objective much faster without disruption on the social and economical aspect. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. We are now actually at the last contribution. And, uh, okay, perfect. Uh, I see. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Can you uh, hear me? Okay, perfect. No. Let me know when I when I, I can start. Okay, Jill, could you upload again, share again your presentation? Because there was an overlap with the previous one. Do you want me to upload it? But do, do, can, I'm sharing my screen. Do you see it now? Not, not yet. Sir. Could you unshare and then share again? Okay, perfect. Okay, when you when you go to the presentation mode. Hold on, hold on. I have a problem. I have a problem. No, we were seeing your slides uh, actually. Yeah, yes, but I cannot enter in, in presentation mode. That's yes, a problem. Uh, um. You cannot go to the presentation mode? No. Uh, if you can at least uh, enlarge your skin. Yes, okay, no, no, it should be okay. We are there. Perfect. So we remain uh, in the realm uh, of uh, engine and vehicles uh, with a contribution uh, from Jill Ardi, CNH Industrial. Uh, the title of his contribution, as you see, is use of e-fuels, internal combustion engine potential for heavy-duty applications. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alessandra, for, for this um, uh, introduction. Um, okay, well, we have some delays, so I'll try to, to shorten a little bit my presentation. But basically, what you're going to show you're going to show here, it's a real application of e-fuel. I see in a previous presentation, you've seen mainly presentation about how to produce an e-fuel, and here I will mainly focus on what I will show you is DME. I'm working for CNH Industrial. I'll not uh, introduce myself again, but in CNH Industrial, I think most of you knows about it. No, I mean, uh, we produce on-road vehicle, off-road vehicle, and uh, I work for FPT, which is the, the power train uh, division. So, our motivation to look at uh, alternative fuel uh, date from three, four years ago when we learned from EU that uh, tank to wheel uh, CO2 emission reduction would have to be reduced by uh, about 15% uh, in 2025. Okay, so if you compare with 2019 and by 30% uh, by 2030. So this is, uh, it's almost like tomorrow. So basically we start to, to build some um, 
uh, we looked at different fuel. I mean, typical fuel, okay, the diesel, uh, what we call the B7 today, I mean, 7% of biofuel. It's uh, our, um, our base case. We look at uh, gasoline to be used in direct injection. We have methane uh, in gas phase, in liquid phase. This vehicle, or this engine already in, in production. We look at propane and so on. Uh, we look at oxygenated fuel like methanol, ethanol, DME, and so on, hydrogen, ammoniac, and also batteries. So we look at tank to wheel benefits. So we just look at the CO2 at the tailpipe. And today, uh, with a methane engine, you have a potential of 15, 17 person uh, reduction on the tailpipe. But the problem is that uh, methane is also released in the atmosphere, and this makes, in terms of greenhouse gas, um, not so beneficial. On the other hand, when we look at uh, DME, uh, we can ex expect something like a 12% uh, reduction uh, in terms of CO2. So this makes it interest interesting. What is interesting as well is that in terms of um, volume density, it's just a factor two compared with diesel. So if you have, uh, uh, if you need to transport one liter of diesel, basically you need to transport 1.8 liter of DME. The other thing that was uh, important for us was to look at uh, the range. So we took typically a 1,000 kilometer range. With a diesel, if you run uh, in flat region, you need about 270 liter. And if you look, if you take typically methane, basically it brings you a fuel penalty of about 200 kilo because you have to take into account that if you transport a gas phase or a liquid phase at minus 160 degree, uh, you need you, you need double wall and insulation, so that's some weight. Uh, if you take, on the other hand, um, oxygenated fuel, you're about two to four hundred, two to three hundred kilo of fuel penalty. If you use hydrogen, then you go close to you can have close to one ton of fuel penalty. And on the other hand, if you use battery today, current lion, uh, lithium ion battery, the, the the weight penalty on a vehicle is about nearly six ton. In the future, this will be, of course, reduced. That means battery, you can take out the, um, about 1.5 ton of engine and transmission, but still there is a, a penalty. I like to, to look at this because a lot of people are still thinking tank to wheel. So tank to wheel, uh, if you compare the final efficiency of uh, with the e-fuel based on methanol or DME, and you compare with an electric vehicle, you still have a factor 1.9. But if you go for well to wheel, basically a factor three. So um, if you compare uh, e-fuel with uh, fuel cell from hydrogen or directly use of hydrogen, it's quite similar in general. But if you compare with electricity, of course, it's a factor 3.2. Um, now, I've done some survey of cost of energy. And if the diesel, if, if this is the price of in euro, uh, per gigajoule. Diesel is about 11 euro. Methanol is about 22, but as you know, uh, methanol is produced from um, uh, from natural gas. So that today, there is a big increase on the price of natural gas. But basically, uh, DME is following the price of methanol is about 25. Now, if you see the, the industrial electricity price is a factor two. So basically, the situation here doesn't reflect really the situation that you would have in the future, where basically, Whatever you do, uh, DME in terms of uh, energy content would be tr about three times more expensive than industrial electric electricity. Now, this doesn't show everything because if you take into account that a commercial vehicle is transporting something, so if you take about, you are covering 650 kilometers at about 80 kilometers per hour, you need about 800 kilowatt hour at the wheel. If you take the next generation of lithium ion battery that's in truck, I mean, basically these are the ones that I use, for example, in the latest Tesla 3. This means about 3.2 ton of penalty on the vehicle. Uh, if And this represents about 20% of the maximum payload, and we take about 15 tons as, as an average. On the other hand, if you take DME, this represents only a fuel penalty of 210 kilos. So, the difference here is no more factor three, but it's factor 2.6. Now we can expect also that internal combustion engine will improve, so we could reach maybe a factor 2.3, 2.4, but you know, lower you can't, won't be able to to reduce. So again, where you're going to use the e-fuel, it will be also driven by cost and driven by your uh, by your vehicle mission.
why DME is of interest is because it's a high C10 number, so it's compatible with compression ignition engine, and it can also be blended with propane, which can be interesting on the US market. There is no direct carbon to carbon bond, so there is no soot precursor, so this is very clean. Uh, combustion, it's oxygenated fuel, of course, uh, meaning a clean combustion. Thanks to wheel CO2, there is a benefit compared with diesel. It's already a fuel standard uh, in California, which is a good news for Europe. And DME can uh, can be uh, transported and stored as a liquid at a rather low pressure of six bars. So we could imagine some engine retrofit possibility for fleet. Uh, if you compare with uh, natural gas, hydrogen, we're in the range of three or 700 bars. And so it's uh, much easier. The volumetric density of DME is about 55% of, of diesel. And Global availability and the possibility to have renewable DME uh, from a renewable source, um, there is more and more potential in the future. So, how do you produce DME? You can go one of the rules today is through dehydration. So, from methanol, you produce a DME, or there is also kind of one step, uh, which, which I think the pro, I'm not expert in, in, in this kind of technology, but which a rather good. Uh, efficiency. I think there are some companies like Oberon in United States which are quite uh, involved with renewable DME, for example, from um, from dairy farms or, um, uh, or, or landfill and so on. Okay, so if you look at the thermophysical properties, I'll not go much into the detail, but it's clear density is lower, low heating value is lower, so basically you need larger injector um, flow to compensate uh, the, the, the lower volumetric efficiency. On the other hand, the airflow requirements are near identical. So if you want to use DME in a typical diesel engine, you don't have to change turbocharge and so on. Uh, the viscosity is much lower. That's the problem also with methanol or also with gasoline. So you need, for the high pressure pump, you need some lubricated plunger. Uh, you have higher CETAN number, which is good for cold start, and there is a possibility to blend, as I mentioned before, with uh, propane. The boiling point and the critical temperature makes it that the DME, once you inject inside the cylinder, it evaporates very fast, so you have a very nice fuel mixture, and these are some benefits. And modular elasticity is lower than diesel, but in the same time, you also use, you inject DME at a lower pressure, so there is no really uh, trade-off. I just want to re remind everybody that one, li one liter of DME at 6 bar 20 degree contains about 23.5% more hydrogen in weight than liquid hydrogen, which is stored at minus 240 degree, and there is nearly two times more hydrogen in weight also than compressed hydrogen at 350 bars. So DME could be also be used to um, to, to extract hydrogen uh, reformation. So the engine setup, we start from a typical uh, Curso 11, which is used in this uh, long haul truck, Iveco Australis. And uh, basically we had previously a project where we tried to score different technology to improve this brake thermal efficiency. So we convert this research engine to DME so we could have interesting baseline. So these are more or less the component used uh, in this engine, the high pressure pump, the piston have been modified, turbocharger, uh, we use a higher efficiency, the nozzle of course, we have to change some resistance sealing and we had a rather sophisticated uh, EGS system with a high pressure, uh, with a with the EGS pump so we could control the EGS more or less independent and, and really concentrate on the effect on the, on the emissions. Regarding the test bed, I'll not enter into the detail, but since uh, DME, it's a gas at ambient, everything, all the fuel lines here have to be pressurized. They have to be pressurized, especially uh, after the engine at the pressure of about 26 bars to keep always everything in, 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 in liquid phase. On the test bed, we put a lot of fuel cooler to make sure that everything liquid phase, but we never had any troubles to stop and start this engine. So we, ne we never had any downtime on the test bed. No detail here, but test bed is uh, uh, fully instrumented. So we had two, two methods to measure the exhaust emission. One with this typical Oriba and one is called FTIR, fully transformed infrared uh, spectrometer and uh, particle mass was measured with a micro suit sensor and we also measure particle number. 
So let's look at the results. So here I'm going to systematically compare two load points. One is this typical 100 kilowatts. Uh, that's the power you need to move a truck at about 90 kilometers per hour on the highway. So it's called the cruising, cruising point. So if you don't have traffic jam, the engine will keep just at this load point all the time. So it's kind of part load. And then there is this load point here where you have usually the best fuel consumption. So for these two load points, we have compared uh, for the same engine what's happened with diesel and what's happened with DME. And we have we we control the NOx uh, at uh, the not at the tailpipe but at the uh, out uh, at the engine out so before the after treatment system uh, by controlling the EGR with the EGR pump. So basically, you can see directly a 12% reduction of CO2 at the screws load point, 11%, and this is more or less what we were expecting, and. What we, we found out that basically we could slightly improve the brake thermal efficiency of the engine by running with DME. Um, and you can see as well that we can bring the NOx almost even lower than one gram per kilowatt hour by increasing, um, by increasing the EGR. So low emissions, which is quite important today, is very important. If you look at the suit, you can see with a diesel engine, the suits start to dramatically increase when the EGR reaches a certain level. And when you're about here below five to six, yeah, six, seven gram uh, NOx, suit dramatically increase, where basically with DME, you don't produce any suit. So it's very clean. And if you look at CO, CO as well, very similar uh, CO production between DME and diesel, but CO is very low on the diesel engine. So there was no issue with DME. And the next slide shows the HC. The HC emission, so unburned hydrocarbon, we're a bit worried uh, with DME, but we were surprised that DME produced almost like one fifth of hydrocarbon produced by, by diesel. So it makes it uh, very clean. In general, what we have observed is that by using DME, because we can use low injection pressure and we can we can also uh, retard the, inj the, the injection. Basically, for a given NOx level, we can reduce the EGR amount. So by reducing the EGR amount means you have to reduce, the, you can reduce the cooling of the EGR, and this means also a lower heat rejection through the cooling system. So there is some benefit. We looked at the particle number because that's a big issue for, for Euro 6 and the next emissions. So typical Euro 6 standards is about Six, six or eight, ten uh, to the power of eleven particle per kilowatt hour, and here we have measured different points, and these are again measurements just after the engine, and you can see that we are one to two order of magnitude less than Euro six standard. Then we look also at some non-regulated emission, uh, like DME. We wanted to see how much DME was crossing uh, the engine without being a. Uh, um, um, oxidized uh, because uh, it could be an issue, but we can see that among the hydrocarbon, uh, basically at high speed, low load, where really the exhaust gas temperature is very low, okay, maybe still the hydrocarbon co contains more or less 25% of, of DME, but this is still quite low. Formaldehyde, cyanic acid, and even N2O, uh, we are talking about just a couple of ppm, I mean, this is it's close to zero because we're at, at the limit of, of measurement. This is just quickly, just to compare, I mean, for people interested more with um, internal combustion engine and cylinder pressure and heat release rate. What we looked at, we really compared two load points, uh, same power and same NOx, and both points were optimized in terms of fuel consumption. And we could find out that uh, the DME is burning much faster, um, let's say, at doing oxidation than, uh, than diesel. We can also see that the cylinder pressure is also very smooth so in terms of noise. You would have also have some benefit. And here we, have, we managed to run basically for this low load point with a certain amount of EGR, 35%, but we could reach Euro 6 emission um for this part load point uh, without after treatment system so this could be quite a benefit when you warm the engine um some i just want to emphasize here what is very important is that when you start to work with this new fuel and this is what uh, tomazo emphasized it's very important to um 
to do some simulations. So we have used LibICE. We have done intensive uh, simulation, this kind of typical sector simulation. And you can see we had with this um, tool from, from Polymy, was a good prediction between uh, CFD and uh, and the measurement, also good prediction of the NOx trends. And this allowed us to try different ball shape. And at the end, this explained why we had very low HC and why we had, from the start, we had a very nice setup. Comments and conclusion. Uh, I would say DME is, a, is kind of ideal compression ignition fuel. Uh, it's nothing new. DME was already used, uh, uh, I mean, not used, but uh, let's say there was some research project in Japan and Korea 20 years ago. Uh, but what is interesting is that there is no soot property and it's easy to handle. Uh, there is tank to wheel CO2 benefit and it's not a greenhouse gas. So it's not like methane, uh, which, you know, especially if it's uh, LNG, you always have some venting. With the right combustion lay layout, DME is very clean. And the main benefit is that uh, all the benefits of heavy duty diesel engine in terms of reliability and power density are maintained with DME. And this is very important because when you run natural gas or e-natural gas, a uh, stoichiometric engine, you, it's very difficult to keep the same level of uh, reliability. Of course, the DME cost is very important. Uh, we still have to purchase some OEM supplier like a high pressure pump. Uh, for fuel system uh, to push for low viscosity and low boiling point fuel. This is important for, for us, uh, or, or may, uh, main uh, uh, engine developer. Okay, in this business of alternative fuel, there are different opinions on hydrogen, methanol, ammoniac, and the main challenge is to align the OEM, the end customer, the fuel companies, the agencies, and the politics. I would say this is the main challenge today uh, to further promote DME. On the other hand, if you want to start within two, three years uh, decarbonization of some fleet, DME seems to be a promising solution because you can deliver e, a renewable DME directly uh, to the operator in bulk and you could consider even retrofit of ex existing fleets so you could have directly a benefit in terms of CO2. Okay, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Perfect. I so. promise. Okay, we are a little bit the, the, uh, late. The camera on. But uh, we have some uh, received uh, some questions uh, from our audience, uh, so we can start uh, from these questions. I'm sorry, but you are supposed to wear your mask. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have received. Um, an interesting question for Carlo, but I think it's a very, very interesting topic uh, that could be actually uh, shared uh, by uh, uh, most of you. Uh, the question is the following. Mobility or chemical industry, who will win uh, for the use of the limited quantities of e-fuels? Uh, I think this is a very interesting a question because, of course, today we have talked uh, and introduced the e-fuels uh, that are actually very, very important chemical commodities. Uh, and so one now starts to think uh, which will be the market uh, that will lead uh, and, uh, and uh, take the lead. Uh, so we will have uh, essentially to wait uh, for legislation, uh, stringent le legislation on fuels uh, to see the real penetration of e-fuels in the market, uh, or we will need to wait uh, that uh, these uh, e-chemical commodities uh, will become uh, economically convenient uh, for really then seeing uh, the spreading also in the transportation fuels uh, market. Of course, I would like to ask to Carlo from his point of view and certainly from the review of the project that you have actually shared with us. I would like to ask to the two contributors who have addressed a little bit 
of the economic uh, analysis, certainly we would like to ask uh, to the oil and gas uh, representative. Carlo. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a very hard question to answer. Um, one possible answer, probably the easiest, is that uh, it will depend on where the higher added value will be. And uh, apparently what uh, the current projects are saying us, are telling us, uh, is that uh, fuels uh, um, for motions uh, have uh, more margins uh, than the chemicals for the chemical industry. So in my view, that will be the starting point. Yeah, also, not an easy question at all. Uh, I think uh, um, it very much depends on, uh, on what are the alternatives for the decarbonization. For, so in mobility sector, alternatives are electrification, hydrogen. So depending on the sector, um, these alternatives can be more or less competitive compared to e-fuels. Uh, on the decarbonization of the chemical industry, I think the alternative competitor could be CCS, so CO2 capture and storage. So taking the CO2 uh, out of the flue gas that are normally emitted and uh, uh, isolating it and putting it uh, underground. So depending on, I think, uh, the development in the next decades of the infrastructures for electrification and or for CO2 transport and storage, you will have more or less competitors in each individual sectors and uh, uh, and so then it will become an, yeah, an, an economic uh, uh, issue that uh, it's very difficult to, pr to, to predict, I would say. I can just add my very biased opinion. Is I think that for really long distances, hydrogen and electricity is not the feasible option. So we will need e-fuels. We cannot avoid it. And uh, what we can do is we can make a uh, chemical industry uh, cycle. So we can recycle the plastics. So we don't need CO2 to produce new. And uh, we need to find this balance. And uh, indeed where the, uh, um, the value is higher. But I think uh, if you Okay. Uh, I, in, in the meantime, I, I was I was looking for a crystal ball here at home to just to see if I could find a, 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 a more credible answer, but I failed. Uh, they already said all of them have already said that the the question is very tough. I, I, I indeed we should compare. Remember, I presented a slide where there was the environmental benefit or versus the uh, market amount. We will say for sure as a larger market, no, because the transportation is expected to play a role. Uh, and uh, maybe chemicals is still lower in terms of volume. Then uh, you have to take into account also the stability of uh, this CO2 in, in your product. Because again, if you are uh, re re relaxing again immediately, the CO2 is a continuous loop. So there are many factors uh, that uh, uh, are uh, uh, driving and conditioning this, 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 the, the answer. For sure, if you are able to, to put this CO2 into a very stable material, a cement material, that would take uh, for sure a, a, a significant uh, role because you stabilize this CO2. It's not going to come out. So it's not so easy to answer. Uh, I don't specifically have an answer on that.
Uh, again, uh, it's not a, 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 an easy answer as well, uh, because uh, biofuel, you know, it's uh, well known that we are uh, changing our some of our refinery into green refinery. So it's a, a clear message. We are uh, putting a lot of efforts uh, on CO2 capture. Remember the uh, Ravenna Hub project in order to uh, reduce uh, our contribution to uh, greenhouse gases. We have severe limits, and you can find in our open, open document uh, in terms of, um, of a reduction of this uh, of the environmental impact expressed as uh, uh, methane equivalent to CO2 equivalent better in terms of scope one, scope two, scope three, amount of uh, uh, CCS that we, the, the amount of CO2 that we want to store in from here to 2050 and so on. Uh, fi trying to find a, a, a role for if you was, uh, we are considering some possible project but for the time being, at the level of uh, be becoming familiar with the technologies, then the application will be a matter of discussion of what is going on. But at least we need to have a, a reliable technology. As I said, there are some uh, technologies that can be applied hmm, for the hydrogenation. But again, it's not so easy to imagine that in terms of if you, were, if you consider methane, it will take will play a big role at least that's my guess maybe methanol it will be a little bit more flexible in the sense as i tried to show during the the presentation so if you ask me to put an euro on methane on methanol i would like to bet on on methanol also because as it was been said is a precaution of dme and uh, there are some uh, and gil pre presented some clear advantages and benefits of using dme Although I should say that uh, when I heard your presentation, I was going back into about 20 years ago because uh, Topsway, uh, I remember when it was also part of our group, of part of ENI group, Aldo Tops of Denmark, that I believe you know quite well, as many of, of the people attending this seminar, proposed the use of DME as alternative to diesel with the same, more or less the same benefit that you uh, show there. But then, what was the point? There was not economic attractive at that moment, because uh, they were not, at that moment, we were not considered, not they, we were not considered the economical benefit. So, uh, uh, it's one point is the just the, the, the cost or the price, depending on which side are you, are you evaluating the, 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 the putting some, some, some fuels on the market, and how it's important is the environmental uh, um, the uh, contribution, which is hard to express in terms of, of uh, euros or dollar per, per ton. So it's a, it's, it's a complex uh, game, and that was exactly the message I tried to forward with my presentation. Thank I don't know, I, I am sure I have not been able to reply to answer the question, but it's a completely a, 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 an open question. Uh, let's say that it's somewhat open, uh, but I see Carlo would like to add uh, some comments. Yes, Stefano, I want somehow to contradict you. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I just would like to take the opportunity of your presence, of our presence here, to mention that uh, ENI and Polimi recently signed a very important agreement uh, on the development of CO2 methanation. And... Uh, I, I'm not contradicting you because in that case, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the idea is that of uh, decarbonizing uh, somehow the energy industry by making something which ENI is used to manage and which can be easily injected in the, in the existing infrastructure, um, allowing to reach the goal of decarbonizing the industry while making something valuable for you. No, I, I, I know, uh, Carlo, what we are doing, but I think you are not contradicting me. You are just attending. I have just said exactly what you are said in, in other words. I said we are experiencing, we are trying to get, get the, or make the technology ready. And that's uh, in case of 
But being sure, because we are developing a, a, a demo or a pilot, whatever it wants, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, exploitation of this route, it doesn't mean that it will be the winning solution everywhere. So, uh, you know, we have discussed uh, quite a bit on this topic. It's a possibility. We believe that it can it can be come real, and so we prepare ourselves with this kind of uh, technology ready for use. But you know how many technology I have developed, not, not so many, but <laughs> that were very perfect, <laughs> perfect. But for, for, from a technology perspective, I just want to tell you one isomerization of C4 olefin, no? A skeletal isomerization. And then was perfect for the market, but there was another constraint that uh, didn't bring it to be Real, 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 a real plan. So, okay. So I, I don't believe you are contradicting me. We are aligned on the same, on the same, uh, uh, on the same, on the same. We need to prepare the technological tools in in case of. Then we be sure that everything will be applied. I cannot bet on that. Maybe it's, uh, if I can comment, uh, it's uh, very difficult to put a definite border in between uh, energy vectors uh, and fuels. Uh, and here we are trying uh, to, to, to also see this kind of aspects. Uh, so there are applications that are more oriented uh, to energy distribution uh, and thus uh, that are certainly more specific and challenging uh, that are related to the uh, mobility. Um, Let's continue to review the uh, questions that we have received. There is one for Galina. Uh, essentially, um, this attendee is uh, asking to uh, give uh, more details uh, on uh, the setup configuration of methanol production within the Converge uh, project. And... Uh, the question asks, uh, if I understood correctly, you firstly have packed bed uh, and then membrane reactor, and maybe there is a question related to the recycle uh, of, uh, of uh, streams. Uh, can you give us uh, a little bit more of detail uh, on the configuration that you have developed and optimized? Um, and if I can add, uh, which is the optimal scale uh, for which uh, you would just uh, see the technology, candidate, Ooh. the technology. <laughs> the optimal scale. Uh, in order to find out which is optimal, you need to try several. Uh, so <laughs> we just start scaling it up, and it's about like one meter height now, so it's uh, difficult to project now further, I would say. But it, it is indeed first a small uh, packed bed reactor, and then it is sent to the membrane reactor. So we would like to already do the partial conversion before, and then enhance it with the membrane. Uh, there are several tubular reactors, uh, I believe, mm, we cannot say how many, but uh, about six or 10, yeah, something like this in this uh, range. So they are packed in the shell uh, with the cooling media. And uh, basically after that, it's um, the output is sent to the gas analyzer like gas chromatography and mass spectroscopy, and there is no recycle yet. So it's not planned to be recycled, but I think it's easy to incorporate maybe in the I don't know, we, we don't set this goal for now, to be honest, because recycle we always consider when we model the process. But when you just want to demonstrate that it works, we don't really build up the recycle yeah. because it's not, if, it's not essential. Yeah, you yes, just want yes. to measure one pass uh, conversion. I do understand. My question on the scale was not related to the scale of testing at which you are, but more related to a more general a topic that is uh, the production of e-fuels. Uh, could be a distributed production or need to be thought uh, still as a centralized production with then a distribution network uh, and thus with the necessary infrastructures uh, of distribution. Uh, yeah, that's uh, actually a very good question. Um, of course, there is always economy of scale. Uh, 
when you have it, the installation very small, it's not economically attractive at all. So, for example, if you have a small brewery and then you have a CO2 waste stream and you want to produce methanol, economically it will be not attractive at all. So, you need to look at the big factories or, for example, Shell. Uh, they have some yeah, huge factories where the CO2 waste stream is also of a high capacity and then they can, of course, produce uh, methanol on their own site or, I don't know, different. It depends on the size of the factory. If the factory is big enough, it can be also decentralized. It's fine, I think, to produce locally, but if the production is really small and the waste stream is small, it needs to be collected because it makes no sense to make a small unit. It's my opinion. Yeah, because it, it will be expensive. If there are additional comments from the audience, uh, go ahead. And uh, if there are questions from the audience uh, in presence, uh, go ahead. Don't be shy. Um, I have another question for you all that is uh, related uh, to... Uh, uh, better understanding, which is the advantage of using e-fuels like methanol for internal combustion engines uh, compared to currently used engines uh, powered by methane. Don't their chemical reaction produce both one man molecule of CO2? And uh, wouldn't it be more convenient to focus only on using pure hydrogen as fuel for automotive applications uh, since the short-term target is the net zero CO2 production. So let's, we can broaden a little bit, uh, making uh, at least uh, a little bit more general. From the point of view of the engine, of the vehicle system, what's uh, right now, I mean, the state of the art of uh, natural gas-driven vehicle or methanol or other e-fuels-driven uh, vehicle? Then we will ask also to Jill. Okay, so. Uh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for the question. I think uh, it's a very difficult uh, answer, honestly. It's not even easy because I think that the development of the different technologies really related to the regulation that uh, currently exists. So, for example, there has been one route towards the use of natural gas in trucks. Uh, so. There had been a lot of development uh, to use them in spark ignition engines, for example. There is uh, the example of the HPDI technology, which can allow to reach uh, efficiencies with natural gas similar to diesel. So that's also a technology that can be not only applied to natural gas, it can be also applied to methanol engines and even to hydrogen or ammonia. So I think that uh, this is uh, such a technology that can... Uh, more or less drive us towards efficient engines even with zero tailpipe CO2 emissions. So that's uh, probably a solution. It's clear that uh, it's even a contradictory, to my opinion, that uh, regulation on marine fuels, they ask for low carbon fuels on the well to wheel perspective. So like methanol is allowed, while this doesn't happen for trucks or yeah. for cars, where instead the tailpipe emission is only regulated. Every development is now strongly related to, to rules, in my opinion. But I see HPDI as a possible, let's say, bridge technology between current uh, state of the art and even zero tailpipe emissions, at least in car, in trucks. Thank you, Tommaso. Jill, would you like to comment? Okay. Um, we, we, we're a bit in the... Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Just confirm that I'm not speaking with myself. Yes, yes. Um, okay. In general, our situation in Europe is a little bit difficult because the legislation against, as Tomazzo said, is only looking at CO2 at the tailpipe. And um, it's a bit in contrast with United States. Uh, I think they are more evolving towards well to wheel. Uh, and this means that maybe we're going to have a problem in our industries that we're going to have to focus mainly on fuel cell, battery electric vehicle, but we're going to miss, you know, um, 
truck business, we export uh, more than half of our production outside. We have big market share in Latin America. You can find a lot of European truck in Australia and so on. And that's the problem is that maybe OEM will start to will start to stop to develop internal combustion engine for this reason. Um, now what's hot is hydrogen internal combustion engine. I mean, for many years everybody thought, yeah, okay, fuel cell, that's the right way. But now hydrogen uh, internal combustion engine with hydrogen is recognized as a zero CO2 at the tailpipe. So now there is again some research on this. But um, it's still in the beginning, so it, it will take a couple of years before uh, this technology will be uh, reliable. Uh, but as I said, the problem there, there is always the, 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 the transport. Hydrogen is not easy to deal with. It's a, it's a fuel that has a, tends to knock easily. It's a fuel that you have to keep in extremely high pressure if you want to have uh, an energy density comparable with battery. Just imagine in 10 years, if the battery density improved by a factor 2.5, I think even hydrogen at 700 bars won't be able to to um, to compete against it, you know? And then, okay, if, uh, let's say, if you drive a truck and every four hours you can stop and reload part of your battery in, in half an hour, I mean, it would be difficult for hydrogen to compete against um, against electricity. So it's it's a very difficult situation. I think this last 100 years, I always said, we have been spoiled because we have more or less had one fuel or even diesel. You could run diesel on your on your chainsaw until a, a, a big container ship. And today we're going to have different e-fuel. We're going to have battery solution. We're going to have hydrogen. So the whole question will be, OK, where do we uh, what kind of mission do we use which fuel and i think this is what we should focus on and it depends on the cost of this e-fuel now if you talk about the farm industry okay you know uh, all our agriculture output come from very sophisticated farm machinery today with high power high output uh, in general people let's say at the eu commission sometime i heard that okay no we can make them all electric and maybe we can bring some cable because they don't drive so far i mean this this machine are producing you need 200 kilowatts they're running for five hours you can't just use this battery or you can't just use a, a big electric cable and i think that if you look at then at the farm industry i don't know in country like brazil or in australia where they need huge amount of energy you can't imagine transport hydrogen or transport electricity i mean no internal combustion engine will be there so where are you going to use e-fuel it's clear for airplanes probably for marine and then there will be a borderline where heavy duty it's a question mark, but certainly heavy duty farm machinery or construction equipment operating in the middle of nowhere where you don't have hydrogen pipeline, where you don't have electricity uh, with uh, high, high power, there you're going to need e-fuel and you're going to need internal combustion engine. And that's why I think hopefully OEM will realize that, okay, internal combustion engine will still have to be developed for this uh, with e-fuel. Let's, let's keep hydrogen outside. Now for light duty, it's, it's difficult. Maybe light duty, some maybe uh, range extender could be developed, kind of serial hybrid that could run on hydrogen or could run on something like DME or methanol. Um, that could be possible. Now, again, I don't think there is huge amount of e-fuel. If you look at the price, you want to look at the most simple molecule, and I would say methanol for me is the best energy carrier for methanol. You can produce DME, you can use methanol directly in your in your car. Um, so uh, I don't believe much in a future hydrogen uh, society, but I believe more in a methanol society because methanol, once it's produced, you can store, you don't have to touch it. Hydrogen will always escape. It will be always a nightmare. You have to compress, transport it, and so on. So you have to produce hydrogen to produce methanol. But basically, I would rather use a liquid fuel in the form of DME or methanol to operate uh, internal combustion engine. That's what I have to say, Molly. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, let me, let, let me ask just a point that comes out from what Jill said, the logistic of distribution of fuel, no? Because uh, imagine that you have a re to refill a, 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 a truck with uh, 700 bar hydrogen. How can you do? Hmm? That's a, a part of it. The, the hydrogen is going everywhere. I agree with you. But the, 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 sometimes we don't uh, consider enough the logistic of distribution for uh, vehicles or for buildings even. No? Remember that uh, 
energy, our buildings is consuming a lot of energy and maybe and they need some kind of e-fuels for their maintenance or for warming up or, or cooling down. So the, remember the logistic of these fuels that is really important. Hmm? Thank you, Thibault. Because, uh, so I, uh, I would like to uh, add uh, for, for Jill another question that was uh, essentially related to the market uh, of DME. I mean, what's uh, the real, the size of penetration of uh, DME in heavy duty in Europe, uh, in US, uh, which are the perspective of other markets uh, I mean, for transportation? Okay, my opinion is the following. Today, it's um, it's very okay. DME is not recognized as a fuel today in uh, in Europe, so you can play with some truck and so on in California. But in Europe, it's you can always have some prototype, but you pay a lot of tax, so you you need a lot of funding to uh, to have a vehicle on on the road. So here in Switzerland, we try to have a a founded uh, project where we're going to put a vehicle on the road running uh, on DME for two, three years. And from this, hopefully, we can gain some experience. And the next stage would be to try to convert some fleets if there is some interest. Okay. Now, I think there is more future with DME if you think about circular economy in uh, in the farming industry, especially uh, if you take, for example, in Brazil, the ethanol uh, industry. Uh, produce a lot of CO2 because some of their machines are running 20 hours a day uh, non-stop for eight months. If you take all uh, the CO2 produced by all the ethanol farm in Brazil, it presents more or less 10% of the CO2 produced by a country like Switzerland. It's huge. It's a lot. So if you could convert some of the biomass of this farm into DME, and today we have some process we can reach like 50 55 percent of energy conversion you can implement this kind of circular economy where the farm could produce its own dme for its own machinery and maybe exp I mean, sell outside partly so i think we should first okay focus on this kind small scale but valuable uh, project now on the long term, it's, it's difficult because even you could say, okay, will be methanol introduced one day? Or I mean, how many DME gas station you have in in um, in uh, in Germany? I think you have only one near Aachen. And how many hydrogen station? I don't know. You have what 10, 20, but you don't have like uh, 10,000. You know, uh, no DME gas station. You can still use uh, for some country like I would take. Think more about Benelux or Italy, uh, the, the LPG GPL infrastructure, because the same kind of fuel, you just have to change some O rings. Hydrogen, on the other hand, it's very expensive. So before we decide to go on full hydrogen, we should really think about all the consequences. And maybe at a certain moment, we should say, no, stop. Maybe it's better to go methanol and DME. Okay. Okay, thank you. I have another question for Tommaso asking about, uh, essentially, isn't it a research and improvement uh, of uh, engines uh, going faster than the development uh, of, uh, of new fuels? Uh, so uh, what is uh, the best investment uh, to go for uh, further research improving uh, the but engine technologies? Uh, I think they must go together. There are, in any case, uh, engines uh, are still improving. Gil discussed about 55% efficiency, which is quite a lot, and uh, more than uh, what we can see, like 48 for a diesel, 42 for a fully hybridized car. But uh, this is not sufficient for the decarbonization. So the two things must absolutely go together, because you cannot... Uh, like uh, reduce uh, uh, emissions of passenger car by 55% only. Let's say improving the engine, this is not feasible. Maybe get uh, less than 10% 10 less than now. But uh, then Carnot is the limit to that. So we need to find other solutions. And for sure, we need to develop fuel in the same time. Thank you, Tommaso. I, uh, just to conclude, I would like instead to ask uh, to the 
colleagues uh, who are deeply involved uh, in research uh, in the development uh, of processes for the production of uh, e-fuels. Uh, how do you feel uh, that uh, the effective penetration of e-fuels uh, is close? Or how do you feel this uh, distant? And what do you think it's, uh, or what do you think it's uh, the most uh, challenging factor? Galina. I can start. <laughs> I currently uh, studied uh, aviation sector. So, uh, as it was mentioned, that uh, for example, uh, synthetic kerosene is already a drop in fuel. We can mix it 50 50. We just need to scale up. And uh, actually, the potential of e kerosene is unfortunately much higher than engine improvement. Yeah, I would like to think it's equal. But um, uh, now I see the regulations are coming. And they uh, remove the tax exemptions, for example, so they force the industry to defossilize. Yeah, it will be forced. So now we're just at the start, but I've shown the implementation plan, and I think by 2050 we will hopefully have it well uh, distributed everywhere. But the question uh, for myself is: I think it was mentioned before whether we should use CO2 captured from burning the fuel or if we should use the biomass, if we have enough biomass? I have this question. If someone has an answer, I would be happy. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to, to add that, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, very, very difficult uh, question, and it's impossible to, to give an answer today, also because the evolution of the different uh, uh, pathways for the decarbonization very much depends I would say mostly depends on, uh, I, th I think, on uh, political decisions, on and so regulations, and on societal pushes. Mm. This is an example I, I do in uh, different contexts, on uh, in, in lectures, talking about power generation, on how the diverse uh, energy mixes we had in the last uh, 20 years in Europe, in different countries, that are very similar also culturally. I think, for example. Italy and France, but France produced most of the electricity from nuclear power. Italy produces today most of the electricity from, uh, from natural gas. Even so, similar countries from a cultural point of view took completely different directions in a, a sector, in power generation sector, when the cost of production of generation in, in the end are similar in, 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 this, in this geographic context. So I think I really think that the direction that we will take on if you will electrification, hydrogen, and the different options for decarbonizing are too difficult to predict. Does not depend on an economic optimum. We are sort of a, of chaos uh, situation that are very much driven by social social pushes and, and political decisions. For, fortunately, we are researchers at least uh, here in this table and. Uh, uh, everything is worth being researched, also because we don't know where it goes. And it's an optimal it's, situation, it knowledge open and, uh, to creativity. Yeah, much more <laughs> difficult for ENI and for FPP. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. I, appre I, appre I, I'm, I thank you for your support in this sense. <laughs> <laughs> Carlo, any comments? Yeah, just I, I fully agree with what the colleague said. Uh, I just want to add uh, two comments. The first one is then, as we discussed, is really a multifaceted problem. You should consider the economics, you should consider the local conditions, you should consider the social acceptance, you should consider politics. You should consider that companies are not that happy to be the first in the list to start with a new technology. So every company is looking around to see if someone start and then they follow. And um, this on one hand. O on the other hand, we have to consider that we are talking about energy transition. We are not thinking only to the final steady state situation, but we are thinking to how to reach the final steady state. And this is a dynamic process. And different options uh, will probably give uh, complementary contribution to reach our final purpose. Thank you very much, because uh, I really think that uh, 
I mean, we are really giving a perspective to new engineers, to new young researchers. There is definitely the need for efforts in developing technology, efforts, I mean, in creativity. It's really late. I cannot by thank all the speakers of today, the speakers in presence, the speaker connected. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, Jill, for your very, very interesting To Matteo, Carlo, Tommaso, and Galina for your contribution. And thank you very much also to all the attendees of this webinar. And see you for the next occasion. Bye bye. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.